Good morning. We are still making sure that all of the remote locations are still set up for this publicly accessible meeting. So we appreciate your patience and should be starting shortly. Thank you.
Sorry, this is very new to me. <laughs> new to all of us. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to call the meeting to order at 10.22. Welcome board members and members of the public, both in person and attending via Zoom to the Industrial Hemp Advisory Board meeting. Meetings of the Industrial Hemp Advisory Board are open to the public and comply with the bagley Keenly Open Meeting Act. This act allows for public comment on all agenda items. Audience members may address the board following each agenda item. All speakers from the audience are limited to three minutes. Are there any members of the audience that require accommodations to participate in this meeting? Please raise your hand or use the raise hand feature on Zoom application for those attending virtually or send a message to Industrial Hemp if you have accommodation needs to participate in this meeting. There is a sign-on sheet near the back of the room. We request that all attendees sign in. It is not mandatory for attendees to sign in to participate in a public meeting. It simply helps with minutes and communications to interested parties. We'll take roll call. Uh, we'll start with Emma, and Emma is not attending in a voting capacity today. Hello, Emma. It's not on. Oh, she's not on. Okay, keep going down, and if you give a brief introduction too, please. Justin Eve. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, my name is Justin Eve. I run a company called Seven Generations Producers in Sutter County. We're a USDA certified organic. We have a nursery permit. Uh, and our main focus is, you know, smaller organic farms, but teaching these big guys how to grow organically. Uh, but you know, I appreciate you guys having me. Uh, I'm also a, a representative of the Hemp Farmers Guild, which is a, an official agriculture trade association for hemp based out of California. Uh, and, you know, we're looking forward to cleaning this directive up and, you know, getting us pointing in the right direction so we can get hemp off the ground here in the state. Really appreciate you guys having us. Thank you, Justin. Lisa Herbert. Good morning. Lisa Herbert, Sutter County Ag Commissioner, representing agricultural commissioners in California. Thank you, Lisa. Kevin Johnson. Uh, Kevin Johnson, Humboldt County representative, farmer, certified organic. Thank you, Kevin. Will's not here. Jack Norton. Yes, thanks. Jack Norton, hemp farmer, Turpin Belt Farms uh, out of uh, Alameda County and Contra Costa County. Thank you, Jack. Rod, Rob Porcella. Uh, Rob Porcell is present. I'm a uh, finished products manufacturer, um, president of Royal Element CBD Products, and so I'm here representing uh, CBD product manufacturers. Thank you, Rob. Vanessa Ramirez, and she's not attending in a voting capacity today. Good morning. Vanessa Ramirez, I'm an industrial hemp farmer in Ventura County. The name of my company is Soul Hill Farming. Thank you, Vanessa. Dave Robinson's not on. Richard Soria, retired horticulture instructor and current pest control advisor. Lucas Wilson, and he's not attending in a voting capacity today. Lucas Wilson. Um, NorCal Hemp, Hemp Farmer in Butte and Sutter Counties. Thank you. And as you have seen, we do not have a quorum met for this meeting. And without the presence of a quorum, a deliberative body cannot transact business other than to either fix, item, uh, fix the time to which to adjourn, adjourn, recess, or take measures to obtain quorum. And therefore, um, as we do not have quorum, we will be continuing to address agenda items one through seven as they are not intended to be motion items. They are just informational only, and we can take public comments uh, on those at this time. 
And if there's anything else I missed, let me know. Oh, if we do obtain quorum, then we can continue with um, agenda items eight through twelve um, as uh, as that as that quorum is obtained. If that quorum is lost again, we will have to go back to um, agenda items that are not intended to have motions or um, on them as well. So we can continue to agenda item number four, I believe, or three. Oh yeah, welcome and open, welcome and opening remarks. Okay. Each board member should have received an email with all the handouts for today's meeting. For those attending in person, hard copies have been provided to you and members of the public as well. Copies of the agenda and all handouts are available at the I Have Meeting Information website, and handouts will be brought up via Zoom as they are discussed. Any presentations not provided during the meeting will be made available after the meeting on our webpage. The topics of discussion for this meeting are Bagley Keening Open Meeting Act Review, Board Vacancies, Animal Feed Information Only, Brief Program Activities Update, Report on Budget and Registration Fees, Res Registration Fees Structure Proposal, Report on legislative updates, report on rules and regulations. Are there any corrections or changes to the agenda order? As a reminder, the program asks that all board members check the current board member list posted on CDFA Industrial Hemp webpage for any needed corrections. During the board meeting, all attending board members via Zoom will not be muted by the program to allow for full, Recording in progress. full participation. To minimize background noise, please make sure to personally mute yourself during the meeting when you are not talking. Before we continue, we'd like to go over some general housekeeping notes. Natalie Jacuzzi. So some general housekeeping notes for attendees. Restrooms are located outside of the auditorium to the left. The men's restrooms are the first two doors on the right and the women's restrooms are located down the hall and up the stairs or down the hall and around the corner to the right. In case of an emergency, please exit out of the auditorium, go outside through the front of the building and head across the road to the park. There is no eating or drinking in the auditorium. Uh, we also ask that cell phones be muted, and if you do need to take a call, to please step outside to do so. Additionally, for the board members who are attending, uh, in order to uh, speak at the meeting, your microphone has a push button, which is to turn the microphone on, then you can speak, and then push to turn the microphone off as well. And back to you, Richard. Thank you. There is one break scheduled on the agenda, and we will take a break approximately every hour as needed or requested. A quick note on public comments. We will have opportunities for public comments throughout the meeting, as well as an opportunity for general comments at the end. For comments during an agenda item or pertaining board motion, please keep comments pertinent to the item or motion. At the end of the meeting, we will have additional comments both related to the meeting and for items not on the agenda. For those attending in person, we request all individuals who would like to comment on the agenda item to come up to the podium and use the microphone. For those attending via Zoom, we request all individuals to raise their hand or use the raise hand feature. We also request for each speaker to state their name and affiliation before commenting. Due to the large number of attendees, we will be limiting all commentators to a maximum of three minutes per agenda item, unless there are follow-up questions from the board. We will be timing all commentators and will try to provide warning prior to the time limit ending. Thank you for your consideration as we try to provide everyone with an opportunity to comment during the proceedings. If you have any questions for CDFA regarding industrial hemp and industrial hemp program, please direct your 
questions to the CDFA staff, you may contact them by emailing or calling. There will be now a presentation and discussion by Natalie Jacuzzi. And during opening and remarks, we did obtain quorum. We now have uh, Dave Robinson on. Dave, can you please introduce yourself and um, a little bit about uh, your role on this board? Thanks, I apologize for being late. My, my sheriff job gets in the way sometimes. Um, Kings County Sheriff, representing the California State Sheriff's Association. I, I, my perspective is I, I try to come to the meetings to uh, just make sure that uh, you know, the law enforcement side of the, the house is taken care of and it, and that we pay close attention to, you know, some legislation and the regulations from that piece of the puzzle so it's not too onerous uh, on us when dealing with uh, the hemp stuff in any jurisdiction. So thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Dave. Dave. <laughs> Jinx. Any further discussion or questions from the board regarding this agenda item? This is a brief reminder that all public, public comments at this time should be relevant to the agenda item and directed to the board members. Are there any public comments on this agenda item? So we will be moving on to agenda item number four, the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act uh, review presentation. Mm. And I understand that the agenda says opening meeting act. This is the open, it's the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act. It, so thank you. Um, oh, real quick, um, Natalie, if we could, or I don't know if it's possible, if people are on Zoom and visually they're there, is there any way to portray those onto the screen so we could see them? I don't, that would be a question for Will, I believe. Okay, um, I'm just wondering. I'm there's, yeah. We'll, we'll chat that to Will and get, get back to you for sure. Thanks. Um, so we wanted to do a small presentation on Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act as uh, things were sort of put on hiatus with this for a while due to COVID. And um, there was an executive order that um, put Bagley Keene Open Eating Meeting Act requirements on hold while uh, we figured out how to have public meetings. And so now that Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act is back in effect, we wanted to go over some of the requirements of the board and, um, and attendees as well, just so that board members know what is expected of them and also so that the public knows what to expect from the board members as well, because it's a little bit different now, um, as you can see with our challenges with meeting quorum today. So next slide, please. Oh, I can do it. There we go. There we go. So uh, just a little bit on the meeting, the definition of a meeting per Bagley Keening, Keen, Bagley Keen Open Meeting Act. Uh, it's any congregation of a majority of the members of a state body at the same time and place to hear, discuss, or deliberate upon any item that is within the subject matter jurisdiction of the state body to which it pertains. So we're going to be talking about what that means to be in the same place at the same time and then what those discussions look like as well. But I thought this would be a basic um, good place to start from to give a general overview of what we're going to be discussing in this presentation as to what those meetings look like, what their uh, subject matter is pertaining, and um, and then the requirements of meeting in person as well as remotely as well. So there we go. And quorum. So you guys have already heard a lot about this today. Uh, so we are going to discuss quorum. Uh, this board quorum is... Um, a minimum of seven members. So a minimum number, a quorum is a minimum number of members, usually the majority, who must be present for a deliberative assembly to legally transact business. Uh, for this board, that is seven members that we need to have in attendance at a meeting in order to deliberately act, um, transact business. And a board cannot transact business, which means they cannot deliberate or vote in the absence of a quorum except to adjourn or handle limited non-substantive matters. So this was something that came up at the beginning, that if we did not have quorum, we would be able to give uh, informational items only, and we would be able to take public comment, but deliberations and voting would not be able to um, ensue. So 
Uh, we do have quorum now, and at any time, if that quorum is not met, if we lose a member um, on Zoom or if a member leaves the room and we do not obtain quorum, we will have to go back to um, agenda items only that were not up for deliberation and vote and, um, and then go from there and then potentially adjourn the meeting. So the purposes for which a meeting can be held. Uh, meetings can be held to conduct the usual and customary business as of the board or um, the business of a committee, subcommittee, or task force as directed by the board. Uh, this particular board has three uh, task forces, as you guys know. So I just wanted to include that as well. Um, the subject matter of any meeting is dictated by the authority of the board. And for this particular uh, board that is found in the Food and Agricultural Code, that will be on the next slide as well, just to provide a little bit of clarification and review. I know that um, also this board has had a lot of turnover over the course of the last two years when we have been uh, meeting remotely um, due to COVID. So um, that in language is found in the board's originating act or governing document. And so this is uh, that information for this particular board. It's found in the Food and Ag Code 8101 um, Section E. There are other stipulations that we will be discussing that are also found in the Food and Ag Code about um, the members and roles of the board and um, what roles they have to represent. But this is specifically about the authority of this board. The board shall advise the secretary and may make recommendations on all matters pertaining to this division, including but not limited to industrial hemp, seed law and regulations, enforcement, annual budgets required to accomplish the purposes of this division and the setting of an appropriate assessment rate necessary for the administration of this division. So that comes straight from the Food and Ag Code. And I just, that's really just a refresher. That's not different because um, with Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act going to effect, that's not different. This is more just for a refresher for the new uh, board members and then also for the public as well, just for a little bit of informational item and context. So this is where um, we're really getting into what is different about these meetings versus what they were a few months ago. So teleconference meetings can include anything from telephone conference calls, webinars, webcasts, Skype. Um, so as you can see, we have board members in attendance in person today. We also have board members in attendance via Zoom. And so there are specific stipulations for what that attendance remotely needs to look like. And we're going to be talking about that a little bit more. I might repeat myself a little bit. I know you guys have also gotten a lot of emails in regards to those requirements as well. But this is really just to be clear um, for you guys and then also for the public as to what to expect on meeting agendas in the future as well as this one. So every teleconference meeting location needs to be identified in the notice and the agenda to, um, to be and be open to the public. And as you know, the agenda needs to be posted 10 days prior to the meeting, which means that those locations need to be provided to program, and then they can be provided on the agenda. Um, members of the state body must attend the meeting at a public location. So this means a location that is publicly accessible, um, and that is the intention of really posting it that location on the agenda. Um, and members are not able to attend the media meeting via teleconference or from their office or homes or other, other convenient locations unless those locations are identified on the notice and agenda and the public is permitted to attend at those locations and they really do need to be um, accessible to the public, ADA compliant, um, and all, meet all those requirements as well. So that's how, where these meetings are different. We do have um, remote attendees for this meetings and remote locations and those are posted on the agenda today and should be accessible to the public. So that is a little bit of clarification there. Um, and then a little bit more clarifying language around the tele telephone conferencing and webinar requirements. So um, agendas shall be posted at all the uh, satellite locations where the meeting is being held as well. And also printed materials for discussion that must be available to the participants um, who are attending from those satellite locations. Each teleconference location is identified again in the notice in the agenda 10 days before the meeting. So um, if a board member is attending from that location, they can't change it after that 10 day notification. And um, it will, it, this is really to provide an opportunity for members of the public to address the state body directly at each teleconference location. So each board or committee member location must be posted again in that meeting agenda and notice. And so that's just a brief overview of the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act and what we are navigating in this sort of new world of having a main location, obviously, where you guys are attending and people are also attending via Zoom and the requirements that um, will be on those agendas and then from board members as well and then the expectations from the public. 
And that is it for that presentation. And we can go to questions from the board, I believe at this time on this agenda item. Yeah, I have a question. Um, I was under the, and this is Rob Porcella, I guess for those listening. Um, I was under the impression that the meetings, the definition of a meeting was three or more, but I thought I read on that very first slide it said uh, the meeting definition was majority of members. So I there's some confusion there for, for me. Yes, um, in, it's in order for a meeting to conduct business. So to take, this is specifically a meeting to, um, to take action or motions. Can you put the presentation back up? Sorry. Um, and this is really to call a meeting to order, to take motions and to vote. So obviously if you have um, a, an attendance of three, they can't necessarily like, take motions, things like that, because it's not the majority. Does that make sense? Does that answer yeah, your question? I guess so what I was confusing it with, I suppose, was what would be considered a serial or side meeting. Exactly. Okay, okay, yes, understood. Correct. All right, thank mm -hmm. you. Any more questions from the board? There's a brief minor reminder that all public comments at this time should be relevant to the agenda item and directed to the board members. Are there any public comments on this agenda item? Uh, I had a question, just wanted to, uh, about some clarity uh, about the, is uh, from my understanding, and, and this is Justin with uh, representing the Hemp Farmers Guild, um, I was wondering about, is it specific to agenda items? You know, if, if we say, hey, you know, how'd you feel about how today went? You know, it seems like that maybe is okay. You know, generalities around our, you know, feelings about it. But if, if, from my understanding, the only thing that we're not allowed to discuss is specific agenda items, or is it just specific items pertaining to regulation? around I have like we can talk about personal business like, all of us can get together and we can talk about anything other than specific topics to I have is that correct yeah. sure hopefully everybody can hear me okay uh, this is Joshua Kress branch chief for pest exclusion CDFA so the board can discuss um, so board members can individually discuss as you were saying like business situations things like that just kind of generally um, but conversations regarding board business, so anything that the board has the authority to make recommendations to the secretary on, those have to occur at a publicly noticed meeting. So again, even without a quorum with everybody with more than two people present, we have to notice that meeting, that congregation of board members, if you're going to be discussing anything that would potentially be related to board business. Um, so anything the board could make a recommendation on needs to occur at a publicly noticed meeting. So. Yes, I mean, we know that people in the same industry tend to run in the same circles and tend to interact with each other either on a personal nature or just regarding like their own personal business practices. That's that's well understood. It's just we have to be very careful and very mindful of making sure that any conversations around board business specifically occur at a publicly noticed meeting or publicly noticed location. Understood. And, yeah. you know, from the, you know, the Hemp Farmer Guild perspective, as we're just looking to mimic, you know, the other way agriculture associations work is that, they, you know, they'll get together. The whole industry will get together for a multiple day meeting at some times to make decisions on directive, you know, not specific board business as to what we're going to talk to the secretary, or recommend to the secretary. But they get together and they have these multi day events. Everyone, you know, on this board could essentially, you know, we get together for a big barbecue and talk generalities. But specifics that's kind of when we get ourselves in hot water is that correct correct and so that's an area where if you're aware of multiple board members that are going to be at a specific event to make sure the cdfa staff are aware um, so that way we can provide additional guidance because yes that is common practice that industry uh, there are generally industry um, <laughs> you know gatherings where multiple board members will be present and so there may be things that are on the agenda at one of those large conferences that could potentially be board business. And so we just have to work with you all and be clear as far as receiving those agendas and be able to provide any guidance as far as making sure that the board members are careful as far as what discussions are occurring at those meetings, um, just to make sure that we are, are steering clear from the law. And again, trying to be cognizant of not just the, the letter of the law, but also the impression that could be had where there could be the impression of board members kind of 
engaging and, and having conversations outside of a public meeting regarding um, particular board business. And for some more clarity, Josh, and I appreciate yeah. that. Um, you know, for instance, like let's say the, the meeting's over, right? And I call one of the other board members and say, hey, you know, what do you, how do you think, you know, that went today? What, how do you feel about that? Is, is that acceptable since we're not really talking about specific board business? I'd say you're probably, if you're talking about the meeting itself, that seems to be pushing the line of the, the extent of board business because you're talking about the board meeting, which is part of the board's business. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's something where you're working with another individual member, preparing for meetings or trying to present something that, that might be changed at the next meeting, as long as it's not a serial meeting, that could be acceptable. But again, that that's, you know, we, we'll try to, <laughs> our, our general guidance is to try to stay away from gray areas to the extent possible. Um, and if you feel like there may be one that you're concerned with, engage CDFA staff, and we can always engage uh, legal representation or the FPPC or whoever need, we need to to try to get clarification if there's anything that's kind of bordering. Definitely. And just to, yeah. you know, create clarity, just, to, you know, that wanted to talk about that scenario so everyone listening and, and on the board that's not here present, you know, can understand that we don't, we can communicate, but it can't be specific board member, but, or board, board business, but we can talk about generalities of direction of, not necessarily the board, but industry type things or, you know, private business and enterprise, we can communicate that freely, all of us together, or, you know, but the thing it sounds like we're trying to avoid is these serial meetings where, you know, I talk about one specific item, then even though Jack and I work on a committee, I can't then talk about what we talked about then with Luke or whatnot, right? Is that, that's kind of the... That would the, be a serial meeting, correct? correct. And we so, would want to avoid that. So again, regarding your personal business, um, things that are not within the board's jurisdiction and the board's discretion to be able to make recommendations, those would be fine. Um, it's when you get into the arena of the board's um, purview and the board's obligations and things that we would be discussing during a meeting, that's where we would have issues. And, then, um, and so again, if there are going to be conversations about that, that's not to say that they are entirely off limits, but we need to be clear as far as what they are because we may have additional guidance and we would have to address those on a case-by-case -case basis. And last question, yeah. uh, let's say an association uh, sends an email, uh, not me, but say I'm involved with the association or in a secondary association or outside association, sends an email and includes all of us, as long as we don't respond in mass, but one at a time, is that acceptable? If you're receiving but not actually engaging a communication? Correct. Yeah, I mean, information that's made generally available to a group or to the public should be fine, but if there's a specific... Um, message that you feel might be a concern, let us know and we can look into it further. And then, and then just to create one last piece of clarity around that specifically, uh, let's say someone's communicating from an association or from an outside party outside of the board. They communicate with me and then they take that message and they communicate not my message, but then their own message to another board member. Is that that's within the purview and, and not the violating the I would key? notify CDFA staff and we can discuss that particular situation and make sure that it's it's not um, crossing that line. And well, could, we have could you just answer that now if you could do we would have to look at the specific situation so yeah you i would we would have to discuss that offline and figure out what the specific situation was and whether or not that would be applicable because to me the way you're describing it sounds like a serial meeting but we would need more information okay so i understand all right thank you yeah. josh there will be now a presentation about board vacancies by natalie jacuzzi I think we have to take public comment on uh, the Bagley Keene presentation. Okay, did we get any? That was, yeah, that's, that was that closes board comment, and yeah, yeah, so we can solicit public comments now if you want to. Okay. This is a brief reminder that all public comments at this time should be relevant to the agenda item and directed to board members. Are there any public comments on this agenda item? So we do have written comments um, from Josh Schneider with Hemp Farmers Guild. In the post-pandemic endemic world of COVID, is there any move to reform the Bagley Keen Act in the legislature to accommodate participation by board members via electronic means without the complexity of multiple public meeting spaces? <laughs> uh, and if anyone would would the board like us to expand on that again these questions the comments should be directed to the board but the board would like us to discuss that further we're happy to do so could you just repeat the question one more time go ahead Locke. 
So in the post-pandemic endemic world of COVID, is there any move to reform the Bagley-Keene Act in the legislature to accommodate participation by board members via electronic means without the complexity of multiple public meeting spaces? Um, Chair, if I could, I may, can I take an attempt at that? Thank you. Uh, maybe Kapoor, you could help us out because we've had some conversation about, or I believe it was either Natalie or Kapoor, we were talking about how it, you know, we're in this middle ground where they didn't allow meetings and then they allowed meetings, but then they didn't allow the digital meeting without, you know, open public. Um, and so has there been any further talks about them reworking that legislatively to allow, you know, what Josh is asking? Yeah, so Justin, um, <laughs> we were working under a um, an executive order for the last couple of years with the pandemic. That executive order has expired. It has not been renewed. Um, my personal understanding is that there are proposals in the legislature. I'm not familiar with them, so I can't really speak to them. But my understanding is that there are proposals within the legislature to try to modernize um, these rules to account for kind of this new world that we're living in, doing meetings via Zoom that we weren't doing pre-pandemic. So um, I would say that for CDFA staff, we're hopeful, um, but we're not specifically aware of anything and we're not engaged in those conversations. Just at this point, it's within the legislature. Thank you, Josh, for that. And then we do have Wayne um, who submitted both a written comment as well as a hand raised. I'm gonna read your comment first, Wayne. Um, so the World Act Expo Sessions was an example of such an event. Um, we noticed an invited CDFA and Mark um, McLaughlin, um, no response. Was that how this operates? No response of pushback equals approval. And then um, Wayne, I'm gonna go ahead and ask you to unmute yourself. If you can just uh, state your name and affiliation. Thank you. Yes, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. My name is Wayne Richmond. I'm president and founder of the California Hemp Association and Foundation. I am regional leader for the U.S. Hemp Building Association, and I am the communications chair for the Standing Committee of Hemp Organizations and National Policy Group associated with the National Hemp Association. Uh, in those roles, I have uh, the good fortune of sitting around and seeing the bigger picture. Here I'm commenting as a leader of the members of the California Hemp Association. And so we were sponsors of um, several hemp sessions at the recent World Ag Expo in Tulare. We made overtures of invites to uh, politicians as well as members of the CDFA. Um, you know, whether it was COVID or whatever, you know, we did get some responses that were nice and then we got no responses. And in fact, we got no responses from CDFA or Mark McLaughlin, even out of courtesy. Um, that aside, uh, my concern is that uh, many members, because we do operate in a rather small industry, as you've seen by the, by the reduction uh, percentage wise um, in registrants over the last three years, we're a small cadre, uh, yet the information that um, is valuable to hemp farmers at large and those visiting such events as the World Ag Expo in which California has looked as a leader, these hemp sessions have impacts both statewide and nationally. Uh, in that we wanna get the best speakers. And so several members of the board and we did try, and I believe we stayed clear of any bag, king, uh, any king what act issues. But there's, but you know, there becomes a problem in communications. So I'll leave that as an example of we noticed we got no information. We think we did the right thing. I think everybody. These are recorded sessions, so which will be up online shortly, and you'll be able to actually see them and advise further. Uh, having said that, I'd like to make a comment uh, regarding um, Justin Eve's question to Joshua Kress, uh, the response about having an offline conversation where someone like me, who represents many uh, farmers, both statewide and nationally, has a conversation with multiple members of the board at any one time is none of the business, it seems to me of the CDFA. We are not conducting information uh, uh, behind or, or votes behind the scene, but to suggest that you need to have an offline conversation about um, 
general business interaction or association communications, which are actually private and protected, is beyond me in how you can make that response or even suggest to have that conversation offline. So I'd love to hear your comments about how you, in fact, uh, intend to maybe reconsider that suggested way of handling this. Thank you. Is there a response, anybody, on Wayne's comments? Uh, I don't believe so. It sounded like it was more directed towards staff. And maybe, Wayne, if there's some specific clarity on question to the board, but, or it sounded like it was to staff, though. But well, yeah, exactly. It was both to the last one was to Joshua Crescent, his response about an offline conversation regarding your question about someone from an association having conversations um, whether, you know, um, with, with members of the board is what it sounded like straight up. So I'll and go so ahead and I clarify that, Wayne. And so just to be clear, once again, questions from the public should be directed to the board. If the board would like additional information from staff, please ask so. Um, but just to clarify, just to make sure the board is clear as far as what my statement was, I, what my statement was, was that if the board feels that there are any potential violations to Bagley Keene based off of any communications, to please notify staff. And so if you feel that there's anything that is questionable or even anything that is in a gray area where you have a question for staff because you want to ensure that you're not violating Bagley Keene, please let us know and we'll work through that with you um, to try to try to assist any way we possibly can. So again, just to clarify, if the board feels there are any potential violations, please let us know. We're happy to work through those with you on a case-by-case -case basis and seek additional guidance as necessary. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Okay, we have Emma. Go ahead, Emma. Which one of Emma is attending so she can introduce herself? Oh, Emma, can you introduce yourself, please, first? I'm sorry. And Emma, I've asked you to unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, that took a moment. Sorry. Um, so I, 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 all I said in my comment was just that I would also like the staff to comment on the uh, the Bagley Keen um, post pandemic situation of whether the legislature um, was going to act on it. And I, I heard that comment, so I had no further comment from what I I said in the chat. Thank you very much for asking and and giving me the chance to speak. And Emma, as you are a board member, do you mind introducing yourself? I think you called in a little bit late and we just want to make sure that you, I understand you're not acting in a voting capacity, but just introduce yourself as the board member. Sure. Yes. So uh, I'm Dr. Emma Aronson. I am an associate professor at UC Riverside. I work on um, plant microbial interactions, uh, including uh, hemp plants uh, and their interactions with soil microbes. And um, I am, I'm, I'm, part of the board, but I'm not in California right now. So there was not a location I could go to um, that would fulfill the requirements of the Bagley Keen Act. That's why I'm non-voting today. Um, and I guess I would just throw out there that if there's things that we can vote on in the next meeting so that I could participate and others could participate, we're kind of still adapting to Bagley Keen. So um, my only request is that we, we consider that uh, voting next time would be uh, better for many board members now that we're kind of adapting to this new world. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Next so, on the agenda. To the chair, to the chair if I could. I, I just wanted to say something to Emma and uh, maybe ask if we're going to be able to see her in person potentially at one of these future board meetings. And uh, thank you for your participation and all your hard work there at, with the UC system. How was Justin with the Hemp Farmers Guild? Hi, uh, yes, um, you know, COVID permitting, uh, I, I watch the numbers very closely and I'm someone who feels uncomfortable meeting in groups um, if uh, COVID numbers are, are on the rise as they are at this moment. Um, but in the future, I am very excited actually to get to meet all of you in person. Um, that's something I'm, I'm looking forward to. Hopefully 
uh, if we meet um, sometime in the summer or the fall when it, whenever, when COVID numbers are quite low and, and we can all be physically together, that would be fantastic. I'm, I'm very excited about that possibility. Thank you, Emma. And, and if it gives you any sanctity, this is uh, probably a 2,000 square foot room with 12 people in it. Next on the agenda is board vacancies. There will be a presentation by Natalie Jacuzzi. Hi, everyone. And this, um, I don't have a presentation with this. I just wanted to let the board know that we have two vacancies on the board right now. Um, and it is for positions related to we need to have a representative of a grower with a valid registration. And then we also um, need an additional member to this board um, from an established agricultural research institution. So we will be soliciting for um, board member participate or for board members um, applications in the next few months and sending out a, um, a press release and everything like that. So um, I think that's really the only information I wanted to uh, provide to you guys to keep an eye out with that for that if you, uh, you know, for, want to forward that along and also to the public as well, since this is a venue for that as well. And if there's anything I missed. Okay. And that is it for board vacancies. And we can go to uh, any board um, questions or comments. Can I yeah. interrupt here for a second? Uh, this is Kevin Johnson, bo uh, board member. Um, and I just wanted to say there will be a uh, another a uh, spot for a grower because sadly I'm taking this year off from planning uh, because of unresolved uh, regulations related to inhalables that affect my business. Uh, my permit expires in June. Um, I do uh, I do own a hemp store, so if there's a in the future of this year, if there's any openings under the business, I would be um, I would be good to reapply. But uh, I will be letting my permit expire in June for this year. Thank you, Kevin. Any con further comments from the board? Uh, Jack Norton here. I just want to say I'm sorry to hear that, Kevin, and uh, hope you're growing again next season. Thank you, and I, I plan to. Any further comments from the board? Uh, this is Rob Porchell. I'll just say, uh, Kevin, you know, while you were uh, on the board for a short time, you uh, really did some great contributions, I think, and just wanted to thank you for your efforts. So we'll miss you. Do we have any further comments from the board? Uh, and to the chair and, and Kevin, hopefully we'll, you know, get some participation before your uh, permit does expire. Um, so thank you for that. And also uh, to Natalie, I was wondering the request for the board vacancies, you said that it'll come out in the next couple months? Uh, I think the next We're going to have to review applications and leave open submission as well. So it's probably going to take a couple of months just to fill those vacancies. And since there was, uh, I'm assuming there was other people that uh, had applied previously, uh, do any of those go into the to the pot, so to speak, or do they have to reapply? Um, thanks for the clarification. Yes, that's a good question. Um, we did have uh, previous applicants. We did not have enough um, growers apply, which is actually why one of those vacancies um, exists. And then the established agricultural research institution vacancy is new as well. So we did not actually have a representative from it's called an Erie. Um, apply on the last round. So since that's a new requirement, those will be a new set of applications as well. So anyone is, you know, free to reapply from the applications I saw from the last submission. We didn't have enough to fill these particular positions. Um, so yeah, just important to clarify that when people apply and um, and make sure that we we have all the information that we need to know about their eligibility. Thank you. And if they're applicable and they do apply mm -hmm. uh, and no one else applies, do then they automatically get the board seat or what's that process look like? Um, if, if there's only one person who applies and one person who um, and there's there's no competition, essentially, is that what you're asking? Um, I think I would kick that to Josh, what the process would be. So uh, the, the board is appointed by the secretary in the end. It's the secretary's choice as to who gets appointed and who doesn't. So. Uh, if the secretary feels that that one person who applied for that position is qualified and um, should it be participating on the board, then the secretary would appoint that person. And if not, then it would likely go back out um, for a, a reposting of the vacancy. That would be my assumption. But that's not a call that program makes. Understood. And 
potentially, I guess the board could write a letter, letter of recommendation uh, collectively for someone they may think would be a suit for those positions? So if the board would like to make recommendations that would need to again be done at a meeting. Um, so if the board has someone that they would like to recommend, um, that's normally a process that we would have to develop with the board. <laughs> Usually it results in more board meetings uh, to be able to go through that process. Um, but again, you know, individually, if um, you know, we are again trying to get the information out there to the public uh, to make sure that all of not just the board members, but also industry associations are aware uh, to be able to help get word out. And so, obviously, the any recommendations that we get um, are taken into consideration. But as a board, if you would like to make a recommendation on a particular individual, that would need to be done as part of a board meeting, and we need to work through that. If that's something you wanted to discuss now, if you have a recommendation. Um, right now, we haven't posted that vacancy, so that, that makes that conversation a little difficult to have at this point. But if that's a conversation you would like to have about that process, then we can do that. Uh, if that's something you'd like to talk about at a future meeting, that's fine too. Okay, thank you, Josh, for that clarity. And, and maybe what it is, and I'd propose to the chair and to the board, um, that we do consider uh, putting you know this information out to our networks uh, to see if we can find some good people to fill, fill these seats to assist with us. Uh, so I, I don't think we could, uh, you know, motion for that until the request comes out, but, uh, you know, maybe propose it to the chair and to the board of, you know, if we're open to the idea um, of writing a letter of recommendation to, to find some people to, uh, to fill those seats, I think that would be great. And I also wanted to make sure that we urge people that are listening in to participate in the chat uh, uh, for Zoom and also send emails. And I don't know if we've announced or if in the beginning of the, of the uh, presentation today, uh, in the meeting that, you know, what the contact information is uh, for the department or in, in, uh, for um, the industrial hemp program uh, so people can send in that information because I do believe that becomes public record um, once people do communicate that way. So I just want to make sure that, you know, that we, we urge people to communicate and also that our contact information is available um, for the board and also, you know, for the, for the program specifically so people can you know, uh, write that in. So, you know, I don't think I would I would motion for the uh, recommendation. I mean, you know, I don't know how everyone feels. Anyone else wants to speak on writing a letter of recommendation, but it is something probably that we should do, uh, trying to find other people to, to bear the burden here. So just to be clear, so you're suggesting that um, we have applications submitted, you guys review the applications and then recommend um, which board members. That would be more of the process, right? Correct? Yes, exactly. Okay. Um, and yeah, we can discuss that now. And would that be a motion? Um, I mean, if that's something the board as a whole would like to do moving forward, that's something we can take into consideration. Um, we do have other boards that operate fairly similar. Usually that's how it's written in statute, and that's when we'll operate that way. Um, so I'm just trying to think if we would need a board motion. Yeah, it'd probably be best to do a board motion if that's the way that the board would like to do to handle vacancies moving forward or the filling of vacancies moving forward. If you, if you make that motion, Justin, I'll second it. Okay, then uh, what I'd like to do is when the applications do come in, and uh, I don't know if anybody had anything, but you know, when the applications do come in, when the request is put out, um, if we could, as a board, review those applicants uh, and then potentially, uh, you know, write a recommendation to the to the secretary. Uh, so I would motion to review applicants at the time of request, uh, based on people that do submit their application for the board to review for recommendation to the secretary. And I'll second that motion. Yeah. And so just to offer a point of clarity for how that's done with other boards is that normally we would wait until the application period is completed. We would have a list of everyone who applied and what positions they applied for and what positions they were qualified for. We would schedule a board meeting to review the list of applicants and the board would make a motion recommending specific applicants for appointment or um, in the case of the, when the terms are reappointment, things of that nature. Um, and is, that is, that, is that an item, and thank you for that, Josh. Is that, is that an item that we could address at a regularly scheduled board meeting? So we don't have to have a separate meeting for that? That would be about timing, not about the board meeting itself. Could you provide clarity on the time frame once applicants apply, how long we have to respond and do those uh, responses? Sure. So, Natalie, normally we provide 30 days from the date of posting um, for applicants to provide their, um, their applications to apply for positions. Um, and then there's usually a period of time to be able to review and compile all those. 
Um, so after posting at least 30 days plus time for staff to be able to compile everything and schedule a board meeting, so you'd probably be about two months out at least from the date of the notification going out to be able to have a board meeting to review them. Okay, thank you for that, Josh. And it sounds like then if we have a meeting in about six weeks, if you post it in about two weeks, then it would give us about that 30-day window. So potentially at the next meeting we could, if timeline lines up, we could do that during that meeting and put that on the as an agenda item to review those? Yeah, I mean, as of right now, we're scheduling meetings about every six weeks, which is a little bit tight, I think, for that deadline, because um, it does it only gives them 30, we would have to post it, and we have to have a press release that goes along with that as well, and so that has a little bit of a delay, and then to allow staff to consolidate all the information and make it sort of digestible for you as the board, and then you guys need time to review as well. So I think it would take, like Josh said, it would take a little bit over two months. And right now, as of right now, unless you guys want to schedule the next meeting out a little bit further, which, you know, um, we've had discussions about that. But I think six weeks might be a little bit tight if we want to schedule the next meeting for maybe um, two to a little bit over two months out. Then I think that we could definitely have that information available to you as the board. Yeah, just to, to clarify, because staff would need to take the information that's received and, and actually summarize it for the board. Um, be able to present that information to the board um, and make sure that it's clear as far as who applied, whether or not they were qualified. A lot of times we'll have follow-up questions, things like that. Um, and then also to clarify, staff don't actually do the posting of the announcement. Um, that's done through CFA Public Affairs, and so sometimes there are delays there as well. So we don't we don't control that timeline. Um, so again, we wouldn't be able to commit to a, a six-week turnaround, um, but, but certainly try to move forward as quickly as possible. And then, yeah, kind of depending on when the next board meeting is. Um, that's also something, again, well, <laughs> normally it's something we'd be able to schedule a uh, webinar for, um, but again, that, that can be kind of difficult now with the, the changes to the faculty game. So, yeah, go ahead. I think the motion still stands, but I'd like to just make a request from the department if they could tell us what the timeline is from once the application process, you know, the 30 days closes. I'm assuming there's, you know, have to respond within X number of days. So maybe if we could discuss based on the timeline of the other meetings that we're going to set, try to see how we can kind of fit that in there with something that we're, we're already potentially setting. And if there is no timeline, um, you know, we'll, we'll get to it, you know, as soon as possible. But uh, make a request if there is an actual timeline to find out when that is from the time that the application process closes. Yeah, so you're seeking clarification about the timeline of when the applications come in, how much time staff has to consolidate the information and um, and make it available to the board, and then the amount of time the board needs to review that that information. And then the board actually has a meeting, makes a motion, and makes a recommendation, and that that information is communicated to uh, the, the applicant, correct? No, you got it, 100%. Thank you, Emily. Okay, cool. Yeah, I mean, we can talk about that timeline, and like Josh said, um, I think yeah, it's it's it can it's up to you guys as far as you know when we schedule meetings and things like that. But we've we've sort of given you a window, and then we can discuss further. But yeah, Emma did make a comment. Hey, Richard, well, that it sounds that it would be eight to nine weeks that would work for this, and then Dave did raise his hand and want to make a comment as well. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, Richard. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Just I just wanted a little clarification real quick on the on the motion. The 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 motion it sounds like to basically screen new applicants. Um, I believe in the legislation that created this board, uh, my position for the State Sheriff's Association and the Ag Commissioner's position um, are at the uh, appointment or the the review of those two associations to select somebody and give them. Is that correct, Josh? Yeah, I believe so. Um, Natalie or Locke, if you can clarify, but I believe that's the way that it's written. It's special, certainly for the sheriff, I believe it's as recommended by the California State Sheriff's Association. Is that correct? We're, we're checking, but yes, I believe so. I would just request the motion be modified to to reflect that, you know, a couple of the positions may be um, subject to review by this board, I guess you could say that it would, those positions that are subject to review.
Yeah, so David, um, your recommendation is to, to modify the, uh, the motion to basically exclude spe specified positions that are recommended directly by, um, as directly recommended as provided in the Food and Ag Code, correct? So the State Sheriff's Association and the County Agricultural Commissioner. I think the cleanest way might be just to simply state except for the state sheriff and the sheriff and county agricultural commissioner if that's acceptable to um, the person who made the motion. But I, again, I'll, I'll open that up to Justin. And Dave, if that satisfies your request. Thank you, Josh. Yes. Oh, go ahead, Dave. Just, I, I agree, yes. If you wouldn't mind just clarifying that, that to, to those couple of exceptions. Uh, this is Justin Eve um, uh, with the Hemp Farmers Guild. I did make that request, and I'm, I mean, that's acceptable for me to make those exceptions because I believe we can still vote on and pass the motion regardless of those participations. Thank you, Dave. Sounds good. So we've got a motion as amended uh, by Justin. And Jack, you're still amenable to your second? Yes. Okay. Uh, this is, can, you, can I get clarification on what the, what the exception was again? It'd be except for the the um, the representative of the California State Sheriff's Association and the County Agricultural Commissioner, as identified in FAC eight one zero zero one A three and A four. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions from the board on this motion? Um, I have a couple, or well, I'll just stick to that motion. Um, the motion also is to include uh, review of renewal applicants uh, as well as new applicants. Justin? Uh, it, the, yeah, the, the new applicants, yeah. Uh, but review the new applicants not uh, renewing applicants correct yeah okay. just the new applicants well do you want me to provide a point of clarification yeah, here so rob anytime that there is a um, term that is ending we post that as a vacancy um, and so the board member would have to indicate that they want to continue as a board member but we would still have a posted vacancy at, posted vacancy notice and so um, generally if you would seek to review the applicants each time you would have a vacancy notice it would include recommendations on reappointment as well um, just because again that's part of that same process and okay. it would generally make sense to use the same process regardless of what kind of vacancy we're posting okay perfect um, Understood. yeah so is that does that make sense is that amenable justin is that in line with your motion yes it is okay cool uh, josh i had a question jack norton so a reappointment effectively is the same as a new appointment is what you're saying there. So we post it as a vacancy. So um, every three years, <laughs> we have basically full uh, kind of all the terms end for this board. And so every three years, we will do a vacancy notice for the entire board membership for people to apply. And so the reappointments and new applicants are all taken under consideration for appointment by the secretary. Um, and so, yes, if you were going to be reviewing applicants, you would be reviewing also the, the concept of reappointment as well. Are there any more comments from the board on this motion? Okay, let's go to public comments. That's what I thought. Do we have any public comments? A brief reminder that all public comments at this time should be relevant to this agenda item and directed to the board members. Are there any public comments on this agenda item? I don't see any public comments on the motion in place. Um, however, um, there is a general comment from Wayne Richmond um, um, that it's just sad news for the um, uh, for Kevin Johnson leaving the board. And Wayne did um, want to make a comment that they're that they're in support of the motion that is Justin is moving. Thank you, Wayne. Well, let's take a vote here, Justin Eve. Aye. Lisa Herbert? Yes. Kevin Johnson? Yes. Jack Norton? 
Yes. Rob Priscilla? Yes. Dave Robinson? Yes. Richard Soria? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Moving on, animal feed, this is information only. And in your packet, I know you have a handout. Presentation, oh, she's on Zoom. Oh. Hi, everyone, good morning. Can you hear me okay, Natalie and crew? Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. Wonderful, good morning. Thank you all for having me join your meeting today. My name is Jenna Leal. I work within the Division of Inspection Services, and I oversee the commercial feed, livestock drugs, safe animal feed education, and OS programs within that division. Um, what you're seeing up here on the screen is a overview of a summary, um, and I will get into it, uh, but I wanted to give you a little quick background before I jump into this. A uh, summary uh, of a research study that we conducted on lactating goats um, looking at uh, lipid extracted hemp uh, residue. And so before I dive into this, um, on a national level, the FDA is the regulatory body that approves all feed ingredients uh, for use in animals. They currently have a memorandum of understanding with AFCO, the American Association of Feed Control Officials, and work very closely with their feed ingredient definitions committee on a national level um, on feed ingredient approvals. I think overall, this is a very positive move. FDA does tend to move very slowly and methodically when looking at safety and efficacy data for all new um, and unapproved feed ingredients. And I think over the years, working with their partners at AFCO and having this memorandum of understanding has been, a very, has been very positive for the industry and for new and upcoming ingredients that are coming out onto the market. In California, we have so many amazing and inventive and um, you know, new ingredients coming out all the time that in recent years, we've been faced with a bit of a conundrum and that is that our California markets are moving much quicker, and at times our legislators are moving much quicker than um, our national partners. And so when new legislation is coming out, or say when the Farm Bill, uh, 2018 Farm Bill, um, you know, removed uh, removed hemp and and uh, from um, you know with the passage of that 2018 farm bill and declassified hemp, um, we saw an influx of of interest in being able to feed this to livestock in California. Now, I will preface this with the commercial feed regulatory program only regulates livestock feed. So in this case, I'm not talking about companion animals such as dogs, cats, or pet birds. I'm only talking about livestock and our priority for the regulatory um, feed program is truly um, food producing animals. So meat, milk, and eggs um, specifically. And so over the past couple of years, we have uh, really had a lot of interest in folks wanting to feed this commercially. And while there has been several um, research studies conducted on the, the pet food side, um, there has not been uh, enough research conducted on the um, livestock uh, industries and on the food producing animals um, side for safety and efficacy data. And so we're fortunate enough that uh, part of our commercial feed regulatory program, we have a small subset of that program called our Safe Animal Feed Education Program. And that only focuses on research, outreach, and education to the feed industry. Uh, we are overseen by a body probably similar to you. We are a 
industry funded program. We have a board that we report to. We have a great working relationship with our commercial feed industry. Um, and part of that, we also have a technical advisory subcommittee that helps us in uh, looking at different research projects that are important to, to the industry. And so um, two years ago, we started this research project with the oversight of our technical advisory subcommittee. Uh, we put out an RFP and uh, Dr. Catherine Swanson um, and Dr. Ed DePeters uh, with UC Davis submitted this proposal and we accepted it. Um, and so now, uh, and I will preface that, so we funded this research through the Safe Animal Feed Education Program. Um, they are publishing this. And so what you see here in our quarterly feed update issue, um, this is from our winter issue of 2022. Um, and what I'll go over in general is just some high level overview. There will be um, a very comprehensive um, uh, research project published uh, from this, um, but this is just an overview of that project. Um, and so now I'll kind of dive into it. So we, um, again, we were looking at lipid extracted hemp residue. So this is stems, leaves, flowers uh, from the hemp plant. And um, it was pelleted in a, it, it was given in a pelleted version um, mixed with, um, mixed with uh, um, alfalfa and other, uh, other items that are listed uh, just to help with palatability. Uh, there were three sets of goats that were given um, this lipid extracted hemp residue product. There was a control group a low group that was given 0.3 um, pounds of hemp residue per goat per day and a high group. Uh, I'm sorry, the low group was given 1.5, pounds per hemp uh, residue per goat per day and the high group was given 0.3 pounds of hemp residue per goat per day. Um, this was put in their grain mix and palatability of hemp itself um, was uh, actually kind of an issue. Um, it was definitely more palatable to the goats when it was mixed in to a, like a TMR or a total mix ration uh, type of consistency. Um, samples of milk, blood, urine, and feces were collected weekly um, and they were analyzed for cannabinoid um, concentration. We were looking at different cannabinoids, CBD, CBDA, THC, and their metabolites. Um, and the results were that um, they were found both in the blood and milk samples from both the low and high treatment goats. Um, I think the most surprising was that the THC was found in the blood and milk of the goats consuming the hemp residue since there was no detectable THC um, in the hemp residue itself. It could be due to a couple of things, uh, one of which is that the THC concentration being very low, like 1.2 milligrams per gram detection limit um, in the hemp residue, or, and what, and what we are a little bit concerned about, is that a portion of the CBD in the hemp residue is being converted to THC in the abomasum of the goats. As we know, these are ruminant animals. And so there have been some previous studies that show that the abomasum is a highly acidic environment. And in that environment, um, it can be uh, converted, CBD can be converted into THC in that acidic environment. And so ultimately with those results, um, even though this was a very small study, our technical advisory subcommittee and our uh, feed inspection advisory board recommends that we um, conduct a much more comprehensive study that involves dairy cattle. Um, and it's a much larger study. For example, this study was about $50,000. That next study is going to be about three times the, the cost, about $150,000.
and it started in April of this year. So they're just getting off the ground with the lactating dairy cattle um, hemp residue um, research study. And so we'll see what happens. Ultimately, um, this study is great for us um, because we do want to know whether this is a viable feed ingredient in California, although it is not approved right now for use. Um, this study can help us go one way or another. And so um, I'm excited that we're a part of the research that's going on uh, in this space. I'm happy to answer any questions you have, hopefully not too technical because um, I am not a researcher. And, uh, and I will leave it up to the group to, to ask any questions you may have. And thank you again for having me today. Thank you. Do we have questions from the board? Yes, we do. Go ahead. Jack Norton here. Uh, thank you for that presentation. It was excellent. I had a thank couple you. questions that came to mind. Uh, yeah. Are you concerned that the acetone rinse affected the palatability of the feed? Or is that, that definitely? Definitely could have been. We are looking at other, um, you know, this was a lipid extracted um, hemp residue. We are looking at many other forms in this next feeding trial. Um, and so that will be, uh, it will be um, different, uh, different types of, of residue uh, will be, will be analyzed. And so we'll see that could have had a, a palatability um, effect definitely. Okay. Uh, and also, uh, what lipid was used for the extraction process? Do oh, you know goodness. that? I don't. Let me look here in my notes, but I don't. I don't know exactly. Okay, that's but all right. But you know what? I can definitely look through the information, and that is not something I wrote down. I'm so sorry. Oh, no worries. Okay, okay. Um, am I correct that uh, the treated animals had a lower somatic cell count? Did yes. Okay. That, that was something that was found. That seems, and overall, uh -huh. their milk components were were not affected. Well, uh, what do you mean not affected by their somatic cell count was not affected or their or what was not affected? I'm sorry. Yeah, I'll go into. So um, other components were looked at like fat, protein, lactose, you know, and somatic cell. Uh, and there were no, I think uh, fat did drop a little bit, but it did recover. So no, no other components were, you know, negatively impacted or positively impacted by the uh, inclusion of this. Okay. Okay. Do you know if that lowered somatic cell count was statistically significant? Was that measured? I don't, but I can certainly ask the researchers what their thoughts were on oh, it. Okay. Um, the what I'm thinking is that that would seem generally to indicate an increased health of those animals, and uh, that would be a, a a very good and important outcome. Uh, which might allow for, for example, reduced use of antibiotics if if their if their somatic cell count is dropping. I would totally agree with you. I think that that's something that we need to look at. Okay, and uh, yeah, that's exciting. It's great news. Yeah, uh, again, this trial was very, um, you know, it was a very small trial, and there was you know limited funding and resources, and so. This next trial with the dairy cattle, I think, is going to be um, excellent and well needed, I think, for the industry as a whole. Um, I'm definitely uh, going to go back based on your comments about the somatic cell. I think that's a, a, an excellent point and um, and make sure, verify that they're going to be uh, reviewing that in this next trial as well and look at how that ended up for the the dairy goats too. Um, I know that they did take adipose uh, tissue samples and that has still not been, uh, the findings have not been published on those adipose, adipose tissue samples yet. So we're still waiting on that. They're still at the vet school at UC Davis. So again, this isn't completely finalized, um, but we felt it was important to give an update and let the board know um, 
and and everyone here on the you know on Zoom and in person, the work that we're doing and um, and you know we're happy to get engaged in this space um, because you know it's needed and I think federally we all know things move very slowly and so anything we can do um, for the industry here in California we we're happy to get involved. Absolutely. Okay. Well, I, I appreciate that. I do have one uh, last question that comes to mind. Uh, do you have uh, measurements of the amount of THC content that you were finding in the goats in those milk and yes. blood samples? The, I do have measurements and I can certainly send you, um, uh, we post all of our, uh, all of our um, presentations and board packets, just like probably this group does on our website. And so um, and so there is an entire PowerPoint presentation from Dr. Swanson and Dr. DePeters on this. And it actually breaks out in detail uh, their findings. And so okay. I would actually highly encourage you to, to look at that, but I will put my, um, my email in the chat and I would love for you to reach out and I could just send it to you directly. That sounds great. So you the don't have to search around. Sure. Thank you. The The website would be uh, CFRP.org or where's that at? Could you put yeah, that in the so chat as well? I will. Okay. Yeah, I'll put that link in the chat. Um, my my interest in the THC content, uh, it it is the things you brought up were, were very uh, applicable. Could it come from uh, an amount that was so low that it was not being tested in the matter itself or was it um, being synthesized in the body due to those acidic conditions you were talking about. But um, uh, I think from a regulatory standpoint, people might be concerned about any amount of THC in the meat, but, uh, you know, THC is analogous to an endogenous chemical called anandamide in the body, and uh, uh, I'm not particularly... Yeah, from my own personal standpoint, I'm not threatened or worried about uh, a small amount of THC that is possibly so small that it would never have a, a noticeable effect on any person that was eating that meat or milk. Th thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, this is Rob Porchell. I have a quick question. Um, curious to know what what do you expect the duration of this dairy cattle study to be? And do you intend to um, share those results as well when that's finished? Absolutely. 100% we will be sharing those results. Everything uh, we do is is public and shareable. And I look forward to hopefully giving that presentation here when, when we have some findings. Um, um, so I hope I, I'm asked back for that. Um, but uh, that that um, research study is it's scheduled for 12 months. So it started April 1st of 2022. We should be wrapped up by April 1st of 2023. So um, I am really excited about it. And uh, and even if, if the board is interested, we could have um, updates throughout that um, throughout that research study. Um, just kind of brief updates so that you guys know uh, and gals know what's going on. Uh, that sounds like a great idea. I appreciate that. Great. Um, hi, Jenna. This is Justin. I'm, I have a farm in Sutter County. We're named Seven Generations Producers, but we also represent the Hemp Farmers Guild. Uh, which is a group of farmers here in California and also across the nation, not just farmers, but also processors and uh, working also internationally. Um, and I just want to say I really appreciate the focus and, and the energy that you guys have put into this. I have a, a small set of questions here. Uh, hopefully we can get to relatively quickly, but we really do appreciate you uh, coming to the meeting. And yeah, if you could put your contact information there in the chat, uh, I believe that staff is recording those and then they pass those along to the board uh, as consolidated notes after the meeting. Uh, so thank you again for that. Um, and uh, I guess a, a couple uh, quick questions uh, uh, specific to the the program that you guys uh, you know uh, are hosting here in in this research, I, I was wondering about you know the funding source um, and who's providing the funding source uh, specifically to be able to give you guys the ability to do this research. I see that you know uh, Dan Putman and and um, 
and I'm not, I didn't catch uh, uh, Professor Swanson's first name, but uh, is, is, it, is it a UC funded program or, or where's, where's the funding coming from? Actually, that's a great question. So the commercial feed regulatory program is funded through license fees of everyone who manufactures, holds, distributes, or sells commercial livestock feed in California. And then on a quarterly basis, we have about 1800 licensees 700 of those are in state. And, um, and then additionally, we have a quarterly tonnage tax. So all finished feed sold in California, only finished, not, not, further, not for further manufacturing, but all finished feed um, is assessed 10 cents per ton um, by the last licensee. And that's reported on a quarterly basis. So those two, those are our two funding sources for the commercial feed regulatory program. Now, uh, back in 2005, the Safe Animal Feed Education Program was um, codified in our law, and a 20% of our license fees and tonnage tax goes to support those program activities. So essentially, this, while we don't have a ton of money, um, our, our current budget is just shy of 400,000 for, um, for SAFE and that goes to, you know, the employees who are in that program and our research projects. Um, uh, that is the sole funding source of this project was through our commercial feed industry who pay those fees. Understood. And it sounded like then the researchers were the ones that developed this and made a request then for that research to be done? Yes. So we, uh, our board um, is similarly apprised, just like yours. It's uh, a nine member board, um, eight being licensees and one being a public member. And those folks um, came together at a board meeting and said, we would really like to fund this research. Um, you know, hemp is um, kind of coming up in, you know, uh, this was back in about 2017, 2018. And so it then got tossed to our technical advisory subcommittee who put out a request for proposal and they and this group is who responded to that um, at UC Davis. Okay, great. No, that makes uh, perfect sense to me, uh, Jenna. And um so, I mean, it sounds like it's getting paid through, you know, by the, the tonnage fees from, from the industry. Uh, my question is specifically, and as we've noticed that a lot of our regulation and regulators are regulating us, the industry of hemp, uh, based around THC and CBD, but uh, we're of the belief system, especially with our work with the Canadian partners um, that have been growing hemp legally since the early 90s, um, that the seed itself uh, and the leaves generally, but definitely the seed as recently determined by the DEA does not carry any CBD or THC content. And we do believe through some research happening at Stanford um, around some of these proteins uh, that, you know, the seed itself uh, and potentially the stock, there's a lot of interest around the stock as, you know, uh, it, this technically is a grass and, um, you know, grasses are a majority of the diets for our, you know, our bovines and our and and our uh, ruminant animals, uh, and so I was wondering if uh, and and maybe it's a question of why uh, the hyper focus of CBD and THC. I mean, I understand it from you know we don't want people to ingest something that they weren't intending to ingest to have some sort of negative impact on them. But um, the way we see it, at, at least from uh, the industry standpoint, as agriculture people, not just hemp people, uh, that the seed and the stock and the leaves have a much larger pretense around benefit to the uh, animals uh, that will be ingesting those. And, you know, we'd really like to see some research done specifically on, around the grain uh, of the crop versus, you know, the hyper focus of THC and CBD, even though we understand, you know, about the safe and, and, and you know, the, uh, the DEA and, and FDA directive on that. Um, but from our understanding and, and what we believe based on, you know, international markets and Canadian markets, uh, that they've had some incredible uh, benefits from focusing on the protein, the seed, uh, the, the herd and fiber uh, uh, being ingested as a more of a fresh material before it lignifies. Uh, and then also 
uh, the leaves themselves have some incredible benefits uh, with the amount of chlorophyll and other things that are in there. So we'd really like to see uh, research done on that, feed trials outside of psychoactive properties, uh, because obviously, as you're very familiar, the seed industry and the feed industry is mostly made up of grain. Uh, very rarely are they taking the extracts from the grain and then feeding them just specifically. Generally, it is some sort of a milled product coming from these mm -hmm. grain uh, and grasses and, and other types of crops uh, that we do use. So I, I, mean, I guess the, you know, really appreciate it, but we, we would like to see something outside of that uh, uh, because we think that the, the future of this industry is not built on THC and CBD. It is built on the back of grain fiber, herd, and leaves, uh, which you think is a much larger benefit to the industry and California specifically based on our positioning uh, as a grain developing industry and in, in, in a grain processing industry here in California. So, you know, um, gr really appreciate the work around the cannabinoids, uh, but we th think that, you know, that the real work should be done around grain grain and, and the leaves. And, and I'd be happy to uh, open up the doors and communication with our partners internationally and in Canada um, for the work that they're doing there at the, uh, the Ministry of Agriculture. Uh, they're funding and researching and, and they're going, you know, head first uh, into investing in their protein, protein market based off of hemp seed. So we would like to maybe bridge that gap between California and Canada and some of these other international manufacturers of, of grain for what you're doing, if, if that's a possibility. Um, yeah, absolutely. And we will continue to work with, you know, like I said, this was, you know, this came about in, you know, 2019, then COVID happened. And so anyway, it was a very small, very small trial. And we are not going to be doing the lipid extracted hemp residue for the dairy cattle. I, I know that they have other plans for looking at, um, for looking at lots of different, uh, you know, um, different hemp, um, you know, inclusions into, uh, into the diets. Um, and so I will definitely uh, keep continue to work with our researcher uh, team, which is the same team actually over at UC Davis. Um, and, and, you know, work with those partners and, um, and keep you apprised of, of everything. I think at the time, we did, you know, our main focus is food and feed safety. That's, you know, kind of really our, you know, our North Star, we always go back to, you know, feed and food safety first. And so that's why this was looked at, not to say we won't look at other things in the future. I think a lot of points that you make are, are very valid. And so I, I hear what you're saying. Thank you for for being responsive to that. And the last thing I just wanted to talk to you about uh, around the safety of that, it seems like AFCO uh, is essentially uh, interpreting the interim final rule in the farm bill um, that needs more research essentially to allow feed into uh, the hemp into our feed systems. Um, I, I guess the the question there to you and 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 it definitely we need more follow up, but um, why is it not legal for hemp seed to be consumed by livestock if it's already being allowed to be sold in almost every grocery store, you know, in the United States for seed? So that's maybe something to more discussion. But, you know, we do see that the seed itself uh, and hold seed and many derivatives, hemp seed oil uh, and hemp heart is allowed for human consumption. I mean, I can feed it to my baby, but not my cow. Um, so... Mm -hmm. You know, just just wondering about you know why AFCO is is interpreting the farm bill, stating needs more research for getting into the feed industry, and, and maybe that's something that uh, you know the department and yourself uh, could essentially look at some further data once it comes available, and then make the determination regardless of AFCO's position, uh, and say you know we've determined that that the seed itself um, is, is applicable for, for livestock, but maybe the, the cannabinoid based stuff, uh, needs more research. So, uh, it's just interesting to see if, if AFCO needs to give the direction to CDFA or if, if CDFA can work, uh, you know, interdependently, uh, of them. And, and as you know, California leads the way in agriculture in the world, you know, we, we don't need someone else to tell us, you know, how to do it. Right. Well, <laughs> yes, kind of, but, um, in part, exactly what you've talked about has been our from a you know CDFA's uh, kind of conundrum over the last four years is we continue to see legislation that's happening uh, and being introduced, and 
yet historically we rely on FDA who has an MOU with AFCO. So, you know, the both of them to kind of lead the way we do not want to act as FDA. Uh, it takes, you know, at least seven years to get these additives approved for use. They have an entire, you know, swath of people, you know, here we are just this little program. And so we, you know, the, the, incredible burden that us acting as FDA in California, you know, we want to avoid that. We do not have the money or the resources to act as FDA. But with that being said, you're right. They do move very slowly and industries, you know, private industry is moving much faster than government. We acknowledge it. And so that's right. So we are trying to kind of there's not a lot of research in this space. AFCO and FDA say they need more research. We're trying to put resources, any little bit that we can, into doing the research to help so that they can make informed decisions and they can hopefully use the research that's being done in California to help speed along this process. Um, and so, you know, that's kind of where we are is, you know, they say they need more research. research. Well, fine, our industry is committed to, you know, funding some research in this space um, so that they can use that safety and efficacy data to make, you know, science-based decisions. Of course. Well, no, that, that creates a lot of clarity. And, and again, we really do appreciate the work, uh, maybe through this board and through some of the private industry relationships that we have, not only here in the state, but across the nation and, and internationally, we could uh, participate more in the research and potentially collaborate and get you some other collaborative researchers, you know, as obviously researchers like collaborating outside of their their uh, backyard. So, you know, hopefully maybe that's something that we could do and, and communicate further uh, down the road and really do appreciate your time today and look forward to meeting with you and, and talk with you more in the future. Sounds wonderful. Thank you again for having me. And hey, Jen, Jen, before I, you start, just a reminder, this is a non-action item for the board. And while we appreciate the information Jen is providing and um, are very happy to have the conversation, make sure the information is out there. We do also want to be cognizant of the additional items that we do have to discuss on the board. So uh, if we can kind of, yeah, move forward with the conversation. And then again, Jen is providing her contact information if there are additional questions. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Jen, I just had a quick follow-up question. Uh, there must be an incidental uh, acceptable level of THC in those those products, the uh, meat or milk. Uh, um, I guess if you don't have the the actual measurements handy, you might not know the answer to this. But I was wondering if you did know whether those measured amounts of THC uh, crossed that incidental threshold of acceptable uh, contamination in the in the product. I am not aware of any acceptable THC limits in milk uh, or drinking water um, from the EPA or FDA, um, but I can certainly look and um, and report back for sure. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Gina. Now we're gonna have public comments. This is a brief reminder that all public comments at this time should be relevant to this agenda item and directed to the board members. Are there any public comments on this agenda item? So Josh Snyder with Hemp Farmers Guild um, provided two links um, in the chat. Um, and it seems that Josh also has raised his hand. So Josh, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you and you can help go ahead and elaborate comment. Thanks so much. This is Josh Schneider from the Hemp Farmers Guild. Um, I work also with the National Industrial Hemp Council based in Washington, D.C., and we've been engaged with AFCO for some months discussing this. There's a lot of really great research, especially around carbon sequestration, and there's been some interesting research on the methane output of cattle who are fed um, hemp uh, silage grain as well, that seems to reduce their methane production substantially. So I think there's a real value in looking at hemp as, as part of the context of the governor's approach to carbon mitigation and climate change, because one acre of hemp will absorb the carbon 
output of two automobiles um, in California. And so I think there are some tremendous opportunities here. I thank the CDFA feed department for looking at this. I think this is hugely important, especially with the, the increase in grain and the problems coming from the pandemic and of course the war in the Ukraine and Russia. And so this I think is being watched by farmers who are burdened alongside uh, their, their hemp um, production, certainly with, with animal feed as well to continue to be a world leader. So um, I think that it would be great if I have could engage with the administration on the climate impacts of hemp and make sure that that's included in California's approach um, as a climate leader in the US. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other public comment? Yes, so we do have Wayne who has his hand raised. Wayne, I've asked to unmute yourself. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Um, um, for that uh, wonderful report on the feed. Um, we just had a meeting when I say we, the Standing Committee of Hemp Organizations, which is the national policy group um, and uh, affiliate of the National Hemp Association. In fact, um, we were party through uh, to the uh, letter referenced by Josh Schneider uh, in the person of Courtney Moran and Erica Stark, who was part of the uh, policy group that led to the letter that NIHC recently presented and claimed as their own, which is fine, um, but it's out there and there are a lot of folks involved just to let you know. Uh, widespread support. Um, I've noticed that uh, in this trial, it seems to be particularly focused on CBD extracted pro products, which kind of seems natural a place to start because the marijuana producers want to find a way to get rid of their trash. That's what that's about. Uh, but building on the support of the farmer focus that Justin and other members of the board have recently pronounced, hemp seed oil um, cold pressed is approved for human consumption. Hemp seed um, extracted or hemp seed hearts um, are approved for human consumption. Um, clearly the next trials need to take place on raw non-extracted hemp flowers and other parts of the plant. Right. Um, so my question to you um, is, which is a higher standard, human versus livestock in this matter? I think traditionally the, um, you know, I don't know if I can answer that exactly, but traditionally humans choose their diet. They choose what they put in their mouth. They choose what they're eating. And typically animals don't get that choice. They're only uh, their only option is what we are putting in front of them. And so I, while I, I don't disagree that there is this kind of weird dichotomy that's happening here, I do want to point that out, that, that that is acknowledged. And as humans, we do have options. And so um, I think that's I don't regulate that, that's CDPH and others. Um, so I'm just trying to stay in my lane with animal feed. And um, I, I do appreciate your, your comment, Wayne, um, but that's, you know, coming from my standpoint, that's the, the attitude that we've had with this. Okay, well, thank you for that. But I'd like to build on that, if you will, because the starting of this country, as you might know, George Washington William, grew hemp, you continue, Thomas Jefferson grew William, hemp. William, before you continue, and, and I just want to let was, you know you have a minute and 20. Okay, thank you. Uh, and so, you know, clearly cattle and livestock have been fed hemp since the founding of this country and long, long before that. Um, but your comments notwithstanding don't really make any scientific sense in someone who worked at Jet Propulsion Laboratory and had been around science. Uh, if it's good for humans, it kind of really belies the fact that, you know, that's kind of an outlier in terms of this conversation at this point in time. But I appreciate you responding to it. So thank you. Uh, I know that we're working on this very uh, issue because at the core of it, it affects how farmers can plan their plantings. And here's an example. If I'm going to grow for grain, right, a farmer is going to grow for grain, they literally have to let that plant get so close to being tested hot for THC that it may or may not make it over the finish line, meaning under the required uh, measurement of THC, but it's grain, it's food, and it's, one, and it's a potential disposal method 
which means remediation of any issue, regulatorily speaking, to THC, meaning if it's over 0.3% plus the margin of error, and it's deemed outside. Seconds? Right. So how do we respond to that in ways that affect farmers ability to grow a dual crop, for example, a fiber crop that the ends up also being a grain finished. crop? Thank you. Thank you, Wayne. Do we have any more public comments on this agenda item? Vanessa has been raised, uh, has had her hand yes. raised. Yes, thank you. Uh, Vanessa Ramirez, hemp farmer and advisory board member. Uh, Thank you so much for the research, Ms. Leal. I look forward to see the future results. Uh, we know that industrial hemp is very good for carbon sequestration and consumes small amounts of water. So as a farmer, this is very prom uh, promising and we probably need to bring the appropriate parties together to clarify that this is safe and effective. So you count, uh, just let us know or we need to do something to bring all those parties together. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. And just to quickly respond to Vanessa, thank you. And Josh, I did see that recent study and we are also doing research in um, emission reductions for feed additives here in California. That is a huge topic and something that is a big focus for us in the feed industry, working with uh, knowing that SB 1383 was passed and we have these diversion goals and, um, and methane reduction goals. And so we are looking at that as well. So I just wanna acknowledge I, to Josh's earlier point and others that we are looking, um, we are looking in, in that research um, spectrum and area. And so we will continue to, to give updates to this board as, as things arise and, and we can do that. So thank you. Thank you, Gina. Do we, any other? Uh, Okay, uh, to the chair, if I could, uh, I'd like to make a request. I'm not sure if we need to motion this, but uh, it would be great to get this uh, piece of research since they put some incredible amount of work and it's a great piece of data. If we could post that uh, right onto our homepage for the industrial hemp program, or if there's a place where we could start getting more uh, research centric information um, posted as maybe even like an additional tab or a place place for that. But it'd be great to get this uh, specific uh, document posted onto the onto the website uh, available. Yeah, it sounds like we can make that available under an additional resources tab um, on our website as well. And um, and then as Jenna, as you provide updates on your website as well, we can sort of lead to those. Yeah. So Justin, we don't need a motion for that, and staff can co connect with with uh, Jenna and the in the feed program regarding um, adding something. Probably, I would think to our FAQ um, regarding additional resources. That's normally we tend to put that kind of thing. It would be great even, you know, uh, as there's a few different uh, segments of, of hemp, you know, maybe even having a tab specific that says feed, you know, uh, CBD, uh, grain, you know, fiber, something like that. So it's not just buried in the FAQ, but actually a place where if you went onto the homepage and you're looking for research, it would kind of pop out at you. So maybe just an idea there and, and we'll work through that. But thank you for uh, your willingness to put in some work to get that posted. And thanks again, Jenna, for all your hard work there. Okay, we're gonna have a brief program update. There will be a presentation led by Natalie Jacuzzi. Hi everyone, so we are gonna be doing program updates for the industrial hemp program. This is a pretty standard update that we do for the board almost every meeting um, while I'm waiting for that to be shared. Uh, I wanted to give a little bit of a brief program updates and we usually talk about registration updates, acreage updates. Um, as well as laboratory correspondences, approved laboratories and things like that. There was a request at the previous meeting by a board member to also include some information on outreach. Um, since that is sort of general in nature, we worked with that board member on what, um, what we could provide that would address that request. And so I have several slides. Uh, outreach is sort of a general, a general topic. Uh, there we go. It's sort of a general topic and it's difficult to get metrics. So we can discuss that as I move forward. But uh, I hope to uh, have a conversation about that as well um, within this presentation on program updates. So that being said, I said we would talk about registration numbers. There might be a little bit of a delay here. There we go. 
Um, so these are the registration numbers as of earlier this week. Uh, we have grow registrations at 283 sites, um, 50, uh, almost 5,500 acres and 183 registrants, uh, 32 breeders, 323 acres um, associated with breeder registrations and then 17 breeders. And then we have this um, established agricultural research institution. That's what ERI stands for. We have no registrations at this time that have uh, been approved, but we know that there are um, there are um, applications pending in, in review as well. So um, I have the summating total at the bottom there. There are also several registrations that um, that are um, due this month and, and last month and things like that. So these are currently what's in our records. I kind of want to give the caveat that the year, these might be a little bit behind, especially if you look at um, um, the budget presentation as well, because there might be delays in communication of this information from counties to us and then us and entering into the database as well. But this is our information as of um, earlier this week. Another programmatic update is related to um, laboratories. As you know, um, CDFA is responsible for reviewing lab standard operating practices to make sure that they meet all of our regulatory requirements for um, for um, testing for THC uh, content. And so we have received to date uh, 30 laboratory applicants as of May 2nd, 2022. That 30 laboratory applications does include 10 renewals. Um, and then we have re reviewed and approved 21 of those laboratories and then nine are pending approval. So we have a little bit of a breakdown here as well um, for the, we emailed renewal notices for those 10 laboratories and all of those laboratories reapplied and um, we have reviewed and approved nine of those laboratories and one is still pending approval as well. So uh, that's the laboratory updates, pretty standard. I also wanted to include a slide as well about additional program activities. And I know that we have talked a lot on this board, Justin, you've requested that we talk about, you know, the activities of program and what we do and um, and really how we serve the public. And um, I just wanted to elucidate that a little bit more um, and what our staff does to work with the public, to work with stakeholders, things like that. Um, so as I said, counties provide information to us on registrations. We have to enter those into databases um, as well as the testing and sampling data as well. Um, we also have county cooperative agreements and this is a big update for you guys as well because these county cooperative agreements, as you know, are a big portion of what our program does is that we support counties in their registration activities, um, coordinating with them um, and um, and trying to support them as best we can. And that is also a, um, a significant cost to our program as well. Those cooperative agreements are two-year agreements and they are actually expiring at the end of June this year. So we are actually entering into a new, into a new agreement with them for the um, next two years. And, um, and then that requires drawing up new contracts, new communications. As you know, also additional counties are now registering who weren't necessarily registering before. Um, so that actually takes a lot of legwork for our staff as well. Additionally, when those agreements need to be amended, staff need to work with um, counties to amend those agreements as well. Um, and then we work with counties on ongoing, ongoing activities. And then we also are always processing those invoices. Um, and then I'm not sure this has ever come up, but I wanted to draw attention that we also do get um, public request act submissions. So um, there are requests for information that the program has, and these can these requests can be fairly simple and straightforward, but sometimes they can take upwards of 30 hours per request. So I wanted to really be more transparent about that and the requests on staff sometimes, because we do not have a large staff, but we do actually receive a relatively significant amount of these public requests. And um, so for 2021, we had 24 requests, and already in 2022, we have had five requests, and some of those really um, required staff going through hundreds and hundreds of documents to make sure that it addresses the request, getting them together, consolidating the information, and then providing that um, to our public affairs office and, and providing that to the public as well. So that's, I think we've talked about a little bit about program activities, and so I wanted to be transparent with you, the board, and the public about um, other things that we do other than obviously I think we've just been producing um, a slide to give registration updates and I wanted to give a fuller picture on some of the other activities that staff are engaging in as well. And then we're going to go on to outreach. So this is what was requested and we wanted to talk about outreach. Again, this is a difficult uh, topic to really have metrics on because outreach can, um, it can really uh, transpire in a multitude of ways. So um, we kind of, we looked at the ways that we could 
really quantify what outreach looks like for our program, what it looks like for the counties, what it looks like for um, the public, things like that. Um, and so we, I wanted to talk about some of the trainings that have been provided by staff over the years as regulatory updates have been um, rolled out. And so in 2021, um, staff provided two trainings to provide updates to the counties on regulatory updates. And then in 2020, there was five trainings to counties. And in 2019, there was two trainings to counties. And that's all specifically to update counties on regulatory requirements. Um, additionally, there have been several presentations by program at various venues, and this includes um, commodity boards, public meetings, um, special meetings. You guys talked about conferences. Obviously, there's like the state organic pro conference, things like that. Um, supervisor and staff representation has been present at several meetings over the course of the last three or four years to present about program, to solicit feedback, to um, provide information to the public, to stakeholders, to industry as well, and counties. Um, so in 2021, there was five presentations. I have an asterisk there because there was not a, um, the, the program was in transition and um, had did not have, was not fully staffed and was missing some scientists, was also missing um, a person in my role as well. So it was still provided five presentations. In 2020, there were seven presentations probably affected um, a little bit by that COVID factor and, um, and uh, not having public meetings and, and as many conferences. And then in 2019, there were 10 presentations. Um, and that's really just the caveat of, again, I started with this program in February, so this is what I could find. But these were all meetings that were mostly attended by the public industry, industry interested parties, um, um, and specialty um, and stakeholders as well. And then um, a little bit more about outreach um, is these public correspondences. So we do get solicitations from the public. Um, and um, we also work with counties, as I said, about cor to correspond on activities as well. So public correspondences, I have an asterisk on pretty much all of these because um, we have had a transition of staff over the last year. So we thought it might be best to just provide the numbers for 2021 just to give a sense of what that workload look, looked like for the last calendar year, not even for um, the fiscal year. So um, in just 2021, this is really just for one scientist um, being on staff at the time. There were other scientists on staff but transitioned out and we don't have um, information from them. Um, but we there's uh, just for public correspondences, it was 550 emails and about 324 phone calls. And that does not include the two other scientists as well who were on staff for several months or a few months. Um, county correspondences, um, those emails were about 280 and it also looked like about 90 um, phone calls. And again, these are underestimates because we do not have the data from the other scientists who were previously with the program. Um, and then laboratory correspondences, one of the other scientists was working on those as well. And that was about 104 emails because the way that process looks is that the um, laboratory submits their SOPs, but oftentimes we need clarification. And, you know, like we, what is this process? Or we need additional SOPs or we need them to revise an SOP to be um, consistent with our regulation and our regulatory requirements. So that also requires a lot of time from staff and then a re-review from staff as well. So... Um, that's a little bit about the correspondences specifically um, when we're talking about outreach and working with the public. And I think this is the last slide on outreach and I wanted to highlight this. So this program is obviously very new. We talk about this. This is a relatively new industry. Um, and initially what this program did when it was working with counties, um, when working with counties and trying to establish um, what were the needs of industry, what were the needs of counties, um, and then what was requested. Um, this program originally funded um, several activities for to address this outreach need. And um, for those contracts, those initial contracts that were in the 18, 19, 19, 20 fiscal years, um, we included a lot of public outreach to allow counties leeway to educate the industry about what the requirements were, what was coming down the... Um, and just to make that information readily accessible. And that actually ended up, just that portion ended up being a significant portion of those contracts. And we actually staffed did an analysis of that after those two years to better understand what the cost was for that public outreach um, and that education facet of, that, um, of those contracts. And after analysis, it, um, we had a breakdown in the invoices. Um, over the course of those two years, program paid about 700, over $700,000 towards um, those public outreach hours, hours and those education with county contracts. And it ended up being almost 50% of those contracts, um, which, 
you know, it's obviously that was um, a vested interest in getting the con the public better educated and getting that information out there. Um, but I think as we have more conversations at this board and what the financial constraints are of this program and as we get a better sense of where where we're headed, that was, um, once that we evaluated that, that was um, tightened down a little bit to um, make sure that we had a little bit narrower of a scope as far as what was reimbursable by the, industri the our specific industrial hemp program. Um, so uh, as of right now, the contracts that were for um, the 2021 and 21-22 fiscal years, we do reimburse um, public outreach activities, but it's to much lesser degree and it's really to only um, to approved activities as well. So um, that, that those numbers are up there as well. So for about the last two years, because this isn't the full two contract years, obviously we have another two months in, um, in we have another two months in, uh, uh, in these contracts, and then we also are still um, backlogged on a couple of invoices, but that's looking at about 504 hours, and um, and uh, that's for a little over $32,000. So that was just to elucidate, not only do we do outreach, but we also have funded a significant amount of outreach for counties to have these conversations with industry as well. And um, real quick, yeah. Natalie, before you move on to the next slide. It, I think that's it. it. it okay, great. Yeah. Um, and the, very extensive. Thank you for putting all that together. Yeah, I, I think I, yeah, we talked about this without address your questions, but I think, yeah, we can open to questions if you like. Is that my last slide? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, so go ahead, Justin. Okay, perfect. Well, I was just trying to understand the 42% of contract agreement amounts. Oh, yeah. And the, sorry, this is Justin with the, the Hemp Farmers Guild. Uh, um, so my question was about the 46% of the contract agreement amounts. What does that mean? Is it 46% of of 100% of what you should have paid, or is that, can you just break down that 46%? Absolutely, thank you, that's a good clarification. So um, I guess I should be, it, it should be invoiced amounts. Um, and so the, we actually went through each individual invoice, and then um, we have several sections of the invoice and categories and subcategories, and they broke down how much was invoiced for public out, how much was invoiced for outreach, how much was invoiced for actual registration activities, how much was invoiced for um, regulatory activities, things like that. And for those first two years, yeah, that 46% was actually what was invoiced by counties um, to program to be um, for reimbursable activities. Does that answer your question? What I believe you're saying is that 46% of all money spent by program, 46% of that went to county contracts? or county Not all money spent by program, just money that was um, paid to um, via the county cooperative agreements. So county cooperative agreements are really about, um, they're about half of program costs. And then the other half is for our staff and our staff time. So yeah. So the so the number forty six percent is if Lisa requested a dollar, you gave her forty six cents. No, 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 no. Uh, sorry, okay. <laughs> no. It was um. Yeah. yeah. So forty six percent of county expenditures that were claimed were related to outreach activities for those two fiscal years. For the department to the county. Yes, for the 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 amount that the department pay, funded the county activities, forty six percent of those county activities were related to outreach, and then the other fifty four percent related to other items including the basic registration activities things of that nature so that was basically you know that's what the actually broke down prior to that all those different activities the ones specific to outreach that was where 46 percent of the monies for outreach went okay understood thank you very much any other questions from the board yeah on I, this? i've got a couple quick questions okay jeff um natalie uh, in regards to the public record requests, is there was there an underlying theme, or is there a most common type of request that's given, or, or do they really just run the entire gamut? To yeah, I would say that they kind of run the gamut um, as far as um, they people want to see harvest reports, um, people registrants, um, and we also do. Um, we do post um, valid registrations on our website, as you guys have seen, but usually it's um, a more in-depth request. Um, and maybe if staff wants to expand on that, they they have their more hands on that, so I can ask them. But anything to add? No. Yeah, I think it, I think it kind of runs the gamut. Okay. And then uh, similar question about the public calls and emails. Is is there a is there an underlying theme there? Are people calling to ask? Is the main thing they're doing asking if they can grow hemp or? Is the, the main request uh, asking if somebody's a registered hemp grower or does, is that also very expansive? And 
Um, a lot of the questions really can be answered um, mostly with directing them to the laws and regulations. Um, I think that um, under understanding the clear delineation of what the purview of this specific program is versus once it leaves the farm and whose purview does it fall under at that when it goes to processing, things like that. Um, and so us um, being able to communicate with other programs also um, and make sure that we give the right information um, with them. So for example, if we're directing someone as we had like a, a presentation from the Department of Public Health, making sure that we direct them to the right programs within Department of Public Health, things like that as well. And so people just uh, clarifying those. Um, and sometimes they're a little bit more depth and it's a little bit more back and forth. Um, but those kind of can generally be answered um, via regulatory um, specific parts of the regulations and things like that. Um, but if staff wants to expand on that, unless that's mostly it. Okay, great. Uh, do you all feel like you're being uh, uh, overwhelmed by that call volume and that you might be searching for a better solution to, to not have to spend so much time on things like that? Um, I don't know if it's a matter of being overwhelmed. I think this is this is typical for a new program as far as inquiries go. Um, I think that it's um, I think I just it's important to be more transparent with the board about the demands of staff and, and staff time um, because we also have these board meetings. So I actually didn't include the board meetings, but this is technically a little bit of public outreach as well, right? We have public attendees. Um, there is a significant amount of legwork put into putting on a meeting, um, maintaining a meeting, taking the minutes, communicating with the board, communicating with the public, um, and making sure that everything meets the Bagley Keen Open Meeting Act, which we discussed earlier as well. Um, so that's actually another other program activity that you know could also be can, um, included in this um, but yeah it's definitely it is it's a demanding demanding program I would say and um, as far as um, how to tackle that I'm, I mean we we're I think we're about as efficient and productive as we can be um, with given the time constraints and um, and job constraints and requirements on the program and if Josh has anything to add <laughs> No, nothing. I mean, I, I think you covered it pretty well. I think there are obviously things that are not included on the presentation that staff also do things like, you know, budget exercises and hiring and training and kind of a wide range of just base activities that are required for anyone who works in any program or even really any company. Um, things that you all are familiar with running your own companies, all the things that go into just having people present and kind of basic administrative activities that also go into to it with a, what you see here is a very small team. Um, so no, I mean, I, I think again, I appreciate Natalie putting that information together. The only other point of clarification I was just going to ask was just as far as the public record act requests that were listed, I assume that does not include information that is already publicly available on the website. And so, um, we do often get requests for information that is already available. And so those would be incorporated in those other categories, but that we, we pull those out of the public records act request process just because it's more efficient just to direct somebody to something that's already available. Mm -hmm. Um, and actually, we have a quorum, uh, potential quorum issue. Stay until 1245. Oh, okay. Um, we have a board member who can stay until 1245, but at that time, they will need to leave the meeting and we will lose quorum. So how do we want to address that? I think I will. Um, they will become. <laughs> um, they will not be returning. Okay. Well, uh, on, on that note, um, the rules and regulations uh, task force, we do have uh, potential action items in the uh, uh, pre-harvest notification report and uh, and also harvest definition, but especially pre-harvest notification. So, okay. if, so if it was prudent, we could jump to that and uh, try to knock it out before 1245. Yeah, or if I can make a recommendation, if we can push through till we lose that member and then um, we can take a lunch break then and we can seek some clarification on whether or not Luke would be able to participate uh, after that break. And we might be able to get clarification on that and see if we can come back around and do any additional voting items. Otherwise, we'll we'll proceed with uh, whatever we can after that break. Is that acceptable? Sounds good. Okay. Justin, did you have something else? I was just going to say, you know, since he got that done, if we could get that, you know, fast track the certificate. But um, is it possible to skip forward? since we have a potential actionable item and, and go back uh, and, and skip forward to the agenda item that, that might have an actionable Yeah, the item agenda well. item can be adjusted based off of uh, the, the chair's decision and board's recommendation. If we've got concurrence by the board to, to skip ahead and then kind of table this item for the time being and come back around to be conscientious of time of the board member availability, that'd be fine. Is that something the board would like to do? Any? Yes. Okay. 
Okay. What yes. So we're jumping to agenda item um, 12. Agenda item 12. Agenda item 12 correct. Okay, we're going to number 12. All right, thank you. Report from the Rules and Regulation Task Force. There will be a presentation led by the task force from Justin and Jack. Okay, um, I'm start with item one, the proposed changes regarding pre-harvest notification. Uh, everybody should have received a, an attachment, looks like this. It's titled uh, Hemp Reporting Forms Analysis. It's been color-coded. Uh, and, and our goal here was we wanted to lay out the case for why the, the pre-harvest report was redundant and could be merged into the sample analysis request form. And we even provided um, an example of how the um, how the of proposed language changes to show how the code could be very simply changed to, to enact this. Um, if you look at the hemp reporting forms analysis, hope, uh, it's up on the screen now. Uh, we have uh, the color red representing the planting report, the color purple representing the pre-harvest report, and the color green representing the sample analysis request form. Um, these are all uh, three of the three of the forms that need to be filed when you're growing hemp. Um, and as you can see, the pre-harvest report in the middle. Uh, if you look at uh, every item that's contained on the pre-harvest report, we've color coded them red, purple, or green. Uh, because all except for one item, the anticipated harvest start date, uh, are redundant. They're inc included in other reports. Uh, so the only piece of unique information on the pre-harvest report is the anticipated harvest start date. Uh, this makes an easy solution of moving that anticipated harvest start date over to the sample analysis request form. It maintains the 11-day uh, the rule that was uh, brought up as a concern before. And... Uh, the timelines are the same as well because as the uh, language currently reads, the pre-harvest report shall be accompanied by a sample analysis request form. So the timelines for these two forms are the same too. So that everything is maintained except we go down from three f required forms in this case to two required forms. This will this will reduce uh, burden on the farmers, reduce burden on the counties, and uh, by extension, reduce burdens on uh, the CDFA, I believe, uh, while maintaining all information, all timelines, everything is maintained. Uh, so uh, we believe that this is, uh, this is solid, and we'd like to make a motion that, of course, if anybody has any questions, I'll entertain those, but uh, uh, if not, we'd like to make a motion that we recommend that um, the pre-harvest report be removed from uh, the code and the only unique piece of information, the anticipated harvest start date, be moved to the sample analysis request form. And just to add to that, um, we were really focused on the intent behind that of trying to create a more seamless process for the department to lessen the burden of, of man hours. and. Um, the only other change that might need to be made is changing the name from sample analysis to request form to combine the term pre-harvest report to, and in addition to sample analysis request form. So maybe it's something like pre-harvest sample analysis request form. And other than that, we just wanted to make that clear on our intent of trying to uh, make that more simplistic and uh, erase any duplicity within documentation for the department and for the growers and for staffers of the commissioner's offices uh, to make it a little more straightforward. Yep, absolutely. Is, uh, does staffer or uh, the board have any questions about, about this? I have a question for staff, Lisa Herbert. Um, with the pending emergency regulations that have now been withdrawn, if you can kind of explain that a little bit, and I did not cross-check the new proposed emergency regulations with this analysis form. I don't know which things would change after the regulations are actually established. The emergency regulations that were proposed and then withdrawn um, have do not affect um, the requirements of the pre-harvest report of the sample analysis request form. So does that answer your question? Yeah. Awesome. Any other questions or comments? 
uh, then uh, I'd, I'd like to make the motion as I stated uh, previously, if that's okay. Go ahead. Uh, motion so so uh, stated. And what's the motion again? Uh, the motion is to remove the pre-harvest report form from the uh, from the code and take the only unique piece of information, the anticipated harvest start date, and move it to the sample analysis request form. Do I hear a motion? Yes. No. That, that's the motion. Okay, I'm was, there, that motion. was there a second? Uh, this is Justin Eve. I'd like to second that motion. Okay, and just to clarify, so the motion is to amend um, regulation section 4940 as presented, is that correct? Yes, correct. Uh, the, the, the precise method that that could be accomplished is accompanied, does accompany the, is the attached document. Perfect. Um, so we would recommend it be changed that way. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you. Well, we have a motion on the board. Should we take a vote? Or any first, what? Right? Yeah. Public comments? We need public comments first. Sorry, wait, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So is there any discussion from the board? No. Okay, public comments on this agenda item. On this agenda motion, excuse me. We do have a hand raised from Josh Schneider. Josh, I'm going to ask to unmute yourself. Thank you so much for um, considering this and working through this. This is exactly the kind of thing that I have needs to be doing more of. And so we're thrilled to see these kinds of recommendations for lightening the regulatory burden on both farmers and the counties. Um, given how much money was spent last year talking to counties, uh, we think anything you can do to keep this simple and straightforward is, is a huge benefit to the industry. So thank you to the board and thank you to the CDFA for accommodating this. Thank you, Jack. Okay, let's take a vote then. Or someone has to second the motion? We had a second. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Cool. okay, Justin, your vote. Yes. Yes. Lisa. Yes. Kevin. Yes. Jack. Yes. Dave Robinson. I didn't hear him. Rich Soria says yes. Dave, I've asked to unmute yourself. Rob. I'm right here. And I vote Rob. yes. I missed you. I'm sorry. Yes. Okay, we're just waiting for Dave. Yeah, sorry, I thought it went through. Yes, thank yes. you. Okay, thank you. It passes unanimously. Thank you for your hard work there, Justin and Jack. Okay, then we just keep going on the agenda then. Oh, yeah, uh, we, we could move on uh, in, the, in the time we have before lunch to, to talk about the proposed changes regarding harvest definition as well. Um, let me bring that up. And uh, thank you to the board for, uh, I feel like we made some excellent progress today. We, um, you know that that's going to impact if if uh, the secretary approves that and and uh, moves forward with that. That is going to impact every farmer who grows hemp. It's going to make things easier for them. Every county where hemp is grown, it's going to make things easier for them. Every uh, every employee at CDFA that has to interact with those counties. So that's a uh, it's a big deal. That's so. good. Um, so we had some discussion on harvest definition uh, at the previous meeting, and uh, um, Justin and I, we did some more research, and um, we've included it in another attachment. It's labeled harvest definition with the green, uh, green heading. It's on the screen right now. Uh, to recap, currently we have an unworkable harvest definition that will put every, um, every grower in 
uh, out of compliance, bar none, uh, this year, this new harvest definition. Currently, harvest means the collection of any portion of industrial hemp plant. Um, that would mean if you walked through a field and a piece of hemp was on your clothing, you've harvested. That means you needed to have filed a pre-harvest pre report um, a, and all the other accompanying reports, including testing, to have walked through your field and got a little bit of hemp on your clothes. Uh, that's just one uh, extreme case, but there are many cases uh, where this shouldn't apply, like uh, if you were thinning plants, uh, if you're culling males, if you were doing any kind of uh, in-house testing or, or, um, uh, or any kind of testing, uh, if you're removing diseased parts of plants, if you were uh, um, a grower that would actually physically do removal of crop from the field, uh, if you're doing in, any sampling for research and development, or if you're doing uh, propagation, all those, all those acts aren't, uh, aren't harvest, but they're included in the definition right now. Um, we included, uh, uh, we did some research and saw what other states defined harvest as, and we included those harvest definitions in this attachment uh, for full transparency. Uh, but actually, one thing that we could have elaborated on is that every state we did not include does not have a harvest definition that we could find. It appeared that they had no harvest definition. So no harvest definition is actually by far the most common uh, uh, in a state-by-state -state analysis. Um, and uh, uh, so as a point of, uh, um, uh, as a point of discussion, we had said that the, the harvest definition should reference the actual removal of the part of the plant for commercial purposes, uh, as we tried to encompass uh, what, what really boils down to a harvest and possibly could re uh, reference the maturity of the plant. And then we have a, a, a working recommendation, which included, it's the last item of the attachment of what a harvest definition could be, and it includes both a positive definition and a negative definition, both stating what harvest is and what harvest is not. Um, and it reads this, harvest means the collection of any portion of an industrial hemp plant at the termination of the cultivation process for the purpose of processing, distribution, storage, or sale. Um, we thought that was pretty good, but we also wanted to explicitly say what harvest was not to avoid uh, any of these situations getting pulled into the harvest definition. Harvest does not include material removed from the plant for testing, R&D, thinning, cloning, tissue propagation, mail culling, disposal, or transplants from one lot to another, uh, to another lot if both lots are within the same permit holder's control. Uh, Further, uh, furthermore, um, I think that uh, while we have covered um, that this recommendation, that, that uh, if anybody has any questions about it, or it could elucidate a situation that maybe should be covered by harvest, but that this would leave out, that we should talk about that and see if there's something that uh, could be modified to then include that case. If there's anything that, that we are leaving out that staff or um, ag commissioners could see. Uh, we'd like to speak about that, but if we can come to a consensus, possibly this is another action item that we could vote on. So Thank you. Any, any, yeah, any input um, from the if, board? If, if, here. Yeah, if you t so you're saying harvest would mean harvesting the whole plant? Um, not, not specifically, no. It wouldn't no. have to mean harvesting the whole plant because a plant could be harvested in stages. Uh, if you're, you know, agronomically, right, if we're growing hemp like corn, you're gonna grow it big and then you're gonna pull a machine out there and pull it all at once, right? This is, uh, you're gonna, that's the economical thing to do. But hemp isn't always grown in that fashion. Hemp could be grown in a fashion uh, where you harvest a piece of the plant at first. Uh, it might, it, and actually the way the market is so divided, it's very common. You might, uh, a hemp plant tends to have a dominant apical cola, it's called. And this is kind of the best, the best, highest quality part of the plant. So uh, on, on grows that are not that big or, you know, ones that aren't hundreds of acres in size, you might, you might, and even if they are hundreds of acres in size, you might pay people to go out there and cut those tops off, and that would be a premium product. Or you might even develop a machine that came through and cut them and bagged them. Uh, and then you waited 
a, a longer period to harvest the rest of the material. And it needed a, either you did it at the beginning of your harvest window and the end of your harvest window, or you made a second report and got a second test for the other material. Um, because the, the, the hemp industry is still, uh, it's not as uh, solidified and, and uh, uh, rote as all these other uh, uh, crops, we're still figuring out how to do this. So there, there deserves to be a lot of leeway in how things could possibly be accomplished because the best way to do it is not clear. Uh, so we wouldn't want to include harvest to mean only pulling the whole plant in, for that reason. And so, um, but we did want to make clear that it was, we, that's why we included the language, although Richard, that, that may apply to this, and it's a good point, at the termination of the cultivation process, because we want to make it clear that it, that it is it is the fruits of the plant we're t we're taking, not uh, we're not doing this in the middle of the life stages of the plant. This is an annual plant, and so you, when you take the fruits from it, you're generally killing it. You know, that's how it works. Um, so yeah, if that answers your question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do we have uh, Kevin? Any, any other well, questions? I have a question, uh, Kevin Johnson. I think this recommendation is really great from a farmer's perspective. It 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 um it says what. Um, what's not har what's not uh, the harvest meaning, which there's a lot of things that aren't. And I think we should uh, um, uh, pass this within, we got three or four minutes left. And from a farmer's perspective, this is great. Uh, is, is there any comment from the, uh, uh, the commissioners or the sheriffs uh, in particular about any concerns or issues they see with this that we could, uh, discuss before we try to make any kind of motion. Yeah, Lisa Herbert, Ag Commissioner. Uh, I would like to know from staff where the definition originated, uh, what was the thinking behind it, or the, um, the reason behind that definition, if you know or remember. I, I can tell you from early on 2019, when um, males were being culled, we were told that we were supposed to be collecting a destruction report for every male pulled out. And it's not feasible uh, for us to follow up on destruction reports for those types of activities. But I, but I would like to know uh, from staff what their reasoning or if they had a reasoning for picking that definition. I don't remember picking the definition. Um, I believe that that definition actually was um, was written by a previous staffer who's no longer with the program, and we're not sure about the original, unless Josh knows. Um, yeah, so we don't, I'm not sure of the derivation at this time. Um, I do have a, I know that we only have two, a couple minutes, but um, just a clarifying question, because um, there can be conflicting um, definitions, because something can be two things at the same time. Um, as far as uh, tissue propagation and cloning, that would be excluded. But then what if it is for sale? Then would it fall into that first definition, just for clarification on our side, um, just so uh, I'm understanding no. clearly? No. Okay. So if they it is if it's for sale, then it's falling under the harvest definition. But then if it's for via cloning or propagation, that would omit it. Is yes. What you're saying? Uh, okay. In the, in the state plan, there is, uh, there is new... Uh, my understanding is that there is new uh, regulation for any kind of transport of plant material that the the originating commissioner and the um, destination commissioner need to be notified, uh, and that there those methods provide checks on clones and plants being made and distributed that don't need to have a, a, a harvest test per se. If you know where each one of those plants is going and if it's going to a licensed facility, uh, if it's not going to a licensed facility, that's a problem. And if it is going to a licensed facility, then uh, that licensed facility has to complete their harvest. Uh, they, they will be tested at time of harvest at those facilities. And also with the intent of trying to avoid duplicity, uh, the planting report is where we believe that would show up because as we make clones or plant seed, uh, that is, the, you know, by law, the, the regulation that we have to act upon. So if it was a piece of the plant, you know, removed for cloning, it should show up at the planting report, which you guys, the department and commissioners have full oversight on. So Dave has his hand raised. Dave, if you want to speak. I just had a, 
a question on the recommendation of the definition on harvest. And just to the term uh, or the word in there that says at the termination. So, so could there be another point during the cultivation process that there's not a termination, meaning like if you harvest one part of the plant and then you, you're gonna harvest another part. That, that was my only question was, is the word termination necessary in the definition? Yeah, that's a that's a great question, Dave. Um, um, I that's a great question. Does anybody have a, a response for that? Um, Rob Porcelli here. That was actually really the only thing in that definition that I I found maybe any flaw with or or confusion. But otherwise, I just wanted to sit, uh, state that this is by far the clearest harvest definition of uh, everything that I've seen so far, including all the examples that you've given, so. I have one more uh, question or point of clarification. Where do microgreens fall into this? I don't know if I see that. Um, well, that would be the termination of a plant. So anything for sale at the point of termination. That that would make sense to me. A, a microgreen, as it is in in lettuce or anything else, is a is a sprouted plant that's then uh, harvested and 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 cut. Um, so if if hemp was a microgreen in the same sense, if that terminology was being used in the same way, it seemed like that would include the termination of the cultivation process. But would still fall under testing. Uh, and so would need to be tested. Yes. Thank you. Um, if we now, I guess this is important for the board to consider. If we took out at the termination of cultivation process, uh, harvest means the collection of any por portion of an industrial hemp plant for the purpose of processing, distribution, storage, or sale. Uh, would that meet? Would that still meet all of the the situations that we are looking for? Um, is that that line at the termination of the cultivation process necessary uh, because even in the microgreen sample that would be for sale so that would then fall under harvest it would be a collection for sale so that would be uh, fall under the harvest definition i have a question this is vanessa ramirez when it comes down to microgreens sometimes you harvest twice a week or once a week so or you cut it and then you let it grow again just like cilantro Mm -hmm. And then you go back again. So how do, would we need to have this um, the county and the third party lab there twice a, twice a week or once a week? That's extremely, extremely expensive. I believe that falls into the 30-day window, correct? I think you talked about this um, at the beginning. You would just get the one sample, correct? You, you, would, need, you would need one test per 30 days in the microgreens example. Does that make sense, Vanessa? It does make sense. And specifically, if it, I think that it would create some potential issues if, if we took termination out. Um, you know, that opens up, you know, the door for any aspect and just thinking about the word storage specifically um you know if 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 we were to if it didn't say termination um you know this is any part of the plant um so like if i had a bunch of stocks left over at the end of the season uh then we would be running into that issue i know jack before you guys had like a root issue mm -hmm. so same thing like if you take that root and if you don't do a destruction order then basically that would fall into that so i think that it's important uh, that we work around, if not the word termination, something that makes it clear about the intent for where the material is going, um, because Vanessa brings up a valid point as well. If it's a plant that I'm continually harvesting for any reason, um, you know, it's you know, I think that's where the conversation. Especially when it's, um, it's such a young stage, there is not THC, and last time I did. Um, at the beginning of the last month, I brought the 
county to test uh, my harvest, and there were two different varieties, they charged me 80, I think $87 for their time. I agreed to it. <laughs> and, and also, uh, I had to pay about $195 to bring SE Lab to do the third party testing. So that was almost, what, $250? So if I have to do that every time I do it with my microgreens is, or, or when I do the sugar leaves for a, for a restaurant, you know, they're all sugar leaves. Sugar leaves come back with almost no, nothing, like 0. 0.000 of THC. So I'm, I'm just trying to figure out what's the, really the, the um, what we're trying to accomplish here by complicating it so much. What, what about your um, discussion regarding or referencing maturity of the plant is there i was just going to say maybe it's uh anything harvested uh while plant is in the maturation or flowering stage maybe you could add isn't some that the point there. we're we're trying to you know uh, alleviate any thc concerns really or i mean so it could be then maybe a you know termination within flowering stage but yeah. if termination within vegetative state then if, instead of the language at the termination of the cultivation process, we, during, we use the, a different type of maturity language. Can well, I, if you don't mind me interjecting, I know we are kind of limited on time here. Um, as far as, you know, the, it seems like the conversation right now is kind of headed towards when testing should occur under which types of harvest, rather than whether or not those things actually are harvest, which I think to an extent could be a different conversation that the board could have as far as exemptions for testing for certain types of harvest material okay, and yeah. how to define those and That's how reasonable. to justify those mm -hmm. rather than simply trying to include that within a definition of harvest in which you are taking material off of the plant with the intention of selling with a, a few specified exemptions that are listed here. Um, it sounds to me like those are two different issues. I, I don't know if you all agree to that, but it sounds to me like those are two separate issues and maybe one of those requires some additional thought in investigation by uh, Justin and Jack and brought back for additional conversation later, if that makes sense. So, so Josh, if I understand you correctly, you're saying that uh, the, the second piece should be um, uh, special circumstances that would be exempt from testing, not, and, and, and that we shouldn't try to exempt those things from testing underneath a harvest definition. Well, the, the second set here do not sound like harvest. And so I think you guys are pretty clear, even if you removed the word termination of cultivation process, you still have specific situations where you're removing, it's not the termination, but it's not for sale and it would not be a harvest. And again, it's either because it's for destruction purposes or because it's continuing along within the cultivation process and it's going to be tested down the line. I think that part is pretty clear and I would recommend incorporating all of that in. I think the question of whether or not a particular harvested material or harvesting situation would require testing, to me feels like a separate question that I think the board does need to investigate further and is definitely valid um, and does need to be answered. But I think it's a separate, to me, it feels like a separate question from the straight definition of harvest. Yeah, thank you for that. That's a great suggestion. Maybe to the board uh, and to the chair, uh, maybe what it is is that we uh, redefine harvest definition and then within sampling and testing, define those acts within that subset section of the regulation. So, so I would take that to mean that, um, that move, uh, maybe the wisest thing to do here is to move forward with the recommended harvest definition without at, uh, the wording at the termination of the cultivation process, uh, possibly without the, the term storage as well. Um, and then approach those very valid points that Vanessa brought up uh, in regards to microgreens or, or other material as a separate question, because those are harvests, but those harvests maybe should be exempt from, it's a possibility that those harvests should, should be exempt from testing. Does that sound, does that sound appropriate to everyone? Does anybody have any input on that? So you're saying the the recommendation would be restated as harvest means the collection of any portion of an industrial hemp plant for the purpose of processing distribution or sale correct correct okay.
and then with the included <clears throat> negative definitions as well. Um, unless any, if there's any more, if, if there's any more comment on this issue. Yeah, one, one more real quick. Yep. Yeah, sorry, it's Dave. Um, hey, Dave. The removal of the word storage from that uh, causes me a little concern, but perhaps it could be addressed elsewhere because if you're removing uh, storage, then at what point is it a harvest? At what point does that, that come back as a harvest if storage is no longer on there. So if you remove the entire plant and you and you say, oh, it's just for storage, then you've never harvested, then then what do you do with that? Okay, that makes a lot of sense, yeah. And it, it maybe what it would be in the definition of storage is specific to parts of the plant that would be, you know, a void of, you know, harvest, you know, like if it's the roots or a non-psychoactive portion of the plant could not be psychoactive, maybe that that would be the void. I'm, you know, I'm not sure. It well, let's think like, about the root situation. Yeah. If you if you had the roots, you had already harvested the top, and so there was a harvest action right. on the top, and so those roots are covered, umbrellaed by that harvest action, and you don't. I don't. Maybe you don't have any issue with having the roots sitting around in a pile or or stored in the sack to test later or whatever. So Jack and Justin, just to clarify, these storage situations that you guys are talking about, would they not be included in these exemptions that you have listed here? Um, is this actually something different I think than that's those? Where, I think that's what we're working through is okay. is, is <laughs> where that will be included or not included. Okay. Uh, and and I think D Dave brings a great point. If we delete storage, this is a, a loophole that's created that people okay. can use this loophole to avoid uh, okay. testing or enforcement. So you're or not something. storing for the purposes of research and development or for the purposes of additional propagation or... Yeah, so yeah, for absolutely. those purposes, you're included we already have, We in have here, the negative so... definition of research and development, so that would cover that situation. Right. That's what I was trying to get to. Oh, if if okay. those are already included, then the storage, we storage needs to stay. Sense. Yeah. Okay, well, um, thank you very much, question. Dave. Yes, Vanessa. Um, uh, this is Vanessa Ramirez. Uh, so it seems that we might need to do a little more work on these definitions. I don't think that it's necessary to come up with the final definition today. I wouldn't want to rush into something that needs a little more thought. I do agree that we need to work on it. So I would propose to have it, to work on this and have it ready for the next meeting, if that's okay with. I know the guys have been putting a lot of work and I really appreciate everything that they are doing. Would you be okay of waiting to next meeting? And, and one thing just to think about, Vanessa, currently we're moving into our planting season. And so it could be a lengthy process to get this changed. And currently the definition does state, you know, any removal of any part of the plant at any time. So if we don't put forth a recommendation, which this isn't going into regulations, this is recommending we want information back from the secretary and the department to kind of say this works or doesn't work in this, why it does or does not work. Maybe what we do is we motion to re, to to motion for the definition change remove that at the termination and then see what the department comes back with from there and then at the next meeting or in the time being we can work through these other further definitions um just thinking about us moving into the season and how difficult this could become for everyone involved from regulation standpoint and from cultivation standpoint. How, so how slow this process yeah. could be. Yeah, so because- I have a question. So if anything comes out with an, an emergency regulations, how would the, an emergency regulation affect everything that you guys are working on and that we are all working on? So- Well, we don't, we don't get notice about these emergency regulations beforehand. So we gotta keep trying to do what we can do, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> Okay. But, but the question, yes, Vanessa, you are right. I mean, there's, you know, the emergency regs are emergency regs. And, you know, as Jack stated, you know, we have to kind of propose them moving through that thinking about, you know, the burden that's placed upon everyone involved uh, based on current current definition. So you know, at least pushing the ball forward a little bit. I mean, we could say, hey, you know, we'll wait. But if there is an agreeable definition better than currently exists, maybe we propose that. And then see where that goes because you know just because we propose a definition we don't have power of emergency regs as a board um and so it, it's going to take some time to pan itself out regardless uh and and i would really maybe recommend 
at least before we, whether we do or do not motion, uh, we agree at least on a portion of this definition uh, as a board. Uh, and then we say that looks good whether or not we motion for that. But uh, it seems like at this point, you know, if we were to remove termination, it would, it would read as such, harvest means the collection of any portion of an industrial hemp plant for the purpose of, or it would be uh, of an industrial hemp plant uh, for the purpose of, for the purpose of, you know, or in the cultivation process, but for the purpose of processing, distribution, storage, or sale. So, you know, maybe that would be better at this point and still be inclusive of everything. Could could we? That's uh, Dave. I'm I'm okay with that. Yeah, I, I agree with that too. Because if I mean we're looking back at what our current harvest definition is, um, and you know. I walk off the field with a seed in my pocket and I've harvested and it's, I think it needs a little, little more. And I think what you guys have added here, minus what Dave said, which is uh, removing it at the termination, because I agree that that sort of. It muddies was, the waters a little bit. Right? It, it did. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just removing at the termination of the cultivation process and leaving the rest of it. I think that is a. a a fair place to start with it for sure. And to Lisa's comment, you know, a calling of males is incredibly burdensome and, you know, commissioners going to have to go into the season. If we don't change the definition, potentially they could have to deal with every single male removed. And it sounds like there's more of a burden than it's worth at this point. This might be a solution at least to that immediate. Um, so I, do I we still have a quorum? Okay. Yeah, I haven't left yet. I'm still here. It's me that has to leave. So okay, yeah, thank you, Dave. I, I, and Dave's make, okay with it. I'd make so. a motion to accept. Yeah. All right. Well, I'd like to move. I, the... I'd make a motion to accept that with that amendment. And and I'll second it. Thank you, Dave. Do you have any other comments from the board? Uh, me. And the, we're clear on what the motion is, right? Do we want to reread that definition one more time in all in all clarity? Yeah. So I will read the definition as I uh, understood it. So harvest means the collection of any portion of an industrial hemp plant for the purpose of processing, distribution, storage, and um, or sale. Is that correct? And then the negative de definition. And then the negative well. definition stands as is, unamended. Yes. Yes. Sorry, I'm off. Let's have public comments on this motion and let's stay on the agenda item. Do we have any public comments? Yes, from Josh Schneider with Hemp Farmers Guild. It seems that the relevant metric is the presence of flowers on the plant, the presence of which the presage, the increase in can cannabinoids until the plant is flowering. It makes no sense to require a compliance test or generate paperwork for the farmer and county. Josh does has other additional comments, but he has also raised his hand. So I'm going to go ahead and unmute you, Josh. Hi there. My, my concern, this is Josh Schneider from the Hemp Farmers Guild. My, my concern is that we're creating change to the regulations as usual in advance of the planting season. Any changes that are not clear and well thought through will create havoc for farmers who already struggle to understand these regulations. They will add additional cost for counties that are already overburdened with a program that does not pay for itself. Um, and um, I'm not sure that it's necessary given that much of this was in response to the poorly considered California plan that CDFA did not consult I have on any of this. And as we've already established, mm -hmm. the former staff member who wrote these ridiculous um, components of the California plan um, have created confusion. CDFA doesn't even know where the definition came from and it's overly broad. An overly broad definition will require individual county agriculture commissioners to divine the intent, which is simply not possible, and so you will have a, a range of expressions of how the law is enforced, opening the state to lawsuits against the arbitrate, well, actually opening the counties to lawsuits 
for the arbitrary and capricious enforcement of badly drafted regulations. My understanding was that the current harvest definition is relatively stable. What I believe Jack and Justin were doing this work on was in response to the proposed new regulations to bring the state's plan in alignment with the plan that was submitted to USDA. The fact that this plan had this poorly considered definition is what generated this work. So what I would like to ask is what is the current definition, the current definition, not the proposed definition, not the definition under emergency regulations, but what is the current definition for harvest in the California code? That's what we need to be dealing with because from what I understand, CDFA pulled back the emergency regs um, that they dropped as usual on a Friday. Um, limiting public comment. So is is that, are those the regulations that were pulled back and are we still in theory dealing with the old regs um, because of the pullback of the emergency regs? Could you could you answer that for me? Sorry. And, and maybe what it is is if, if maybe some or some staff could read the current, your answer to your question, the current definition, and then read the new definition. And then maybe, Joss, if you could provide recommendation from your standpoint of which one you, you think may be better off. So anyone from staff can correct me wrong, or Lisa, as far as I know, there is no current definition of harvest in the law or regulation. So this definition that's been proposed is the only existing definition in CDFA in California law or regulation. So, so the, the 4890A13 harvest means the collection of any portion of industrial hemp plant. That's been withdrawn. That's not. That's the proposed. Yeah, that's that's the, the proposed emergency regulation. Emergency regulation was was withdrawn, but will be resubmitted. OK, and well, I, I, I would put for current state plan as uh, as Lisa has has mentioned, um, you know, the uh, the counties have been interpreting these specific situations we are talking about as harvest and has been. Uh, uh, requiring uh, um, work, destruction reports on male culling, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so in, in practice, we are experiencing uh, uh, some situations that would be alleviated by a definition like this. Um, but I'd also say that, you know, we are, not, we are not creating regulations. We don't have the power to do that. We, are, we can make recommendations which would hopefully move for CDFA to then address these things that we recommend. Um, which is about a 90-day process, start to finish. I, I, on I would imagine side. at least, on yeah, right? Yeah, Does that least. sound right? <laughs> Probably longer than that. So our hopes is that we at least have this done by the time main harvest season comes along. So Luke is not out there, you know, 10 days a week uh, uh, in her staff, you know, uh, trying to figure out how many males we've pulled out of the field because that seems like it could be a problem. Um, so it sounds like, you know, could we, so there is no current definition and the proposed definition, staff, if you could read what we are proposing. Um, what you guys are proposing, I think I read it earlier, the harvest mean that what you guys are proposing, the amended portion or what's in the proposed regulations the definitions yeah okay so the proposed um that was in emergency regulations was was withdrawn was um that it means the collection of any portion of industrial hemp plant so um right. and then but but mm -hmm. our and if you could read you know whatever the if we were to pass the motion mm -hmm. to recommend mm -hmm. uh based on what what we've said could you read that yes so that means that it would uh, the definition would be harvest means the collection of any portion of an industrial hemp plant for the purpose of processing distribution storage or sale harvest does not include material removed from the plant for testing research and development thinning cloning tissue propagation male culling disposal transplants from one lot to another lot if both lots are within the same permit holders control I, I I thought that this definition of uh, this this unworkable definition was in the state plan, and that's not that's not correct. It's in the approved state plan. It is not in current law or regulation. It is in the the approved state plan. Okay, so so what that means is that uh, it the enacting regulation still needs to be made, but it is there, right? Okay. 
because it was proposed, then retracted by the department. And so now we're left where we were before. It, it is law that this is the, that that's the definition, but the, enact, the regulations that enacted and will then burden us do not exist yet. Right. But they will, they will, because it is part of the law. So we have a motion, we have a second. If there's any more discussion? Uh, yes. Uh, did we eliminate the word storage, or is that no? We, we kept the word storage. We kept the word storage. Richard, thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Dave brought up a, a excellent point that it would uh, not having that word would lead to a loophole. Okay. Yeah. Also, just a point to the board: we can we can if it's a 90, 180 day process, we can come back and rework this again. But for now, I think we want to move forward with seeing if the department even will accept this. Yeah, to continue on with public comment, Josh um, Snyder. Um, Josh, you only have 16 seconds left, so I just want to let you know that. Okay, I, I think it's a mistake to move forward on this right now. You can take another month and get this right. The definition, as you've suggested, would still capture Vanessa's concerns of microgreens and sugar leaves and any other removal of any part of a vegetative plant, even at fiber. I think you're thank, better off to get it you, right Josh. and leave the counties as it is, not disturbing the industry. Thank you, Josh, for your comment. Thank you. And then we do have written comments from Rain Richmond. Um, he, uh, he stated, how about harvesting seeds for repl uh, replanting? And then microgreens is different from trimming, how? Uh, and then stated, therefore, no testing would be required for microgreens. Uh, just to, to Wayne's point, if, I mean, in a traditional model if you're trimming you have harvested so there was a, a harvest uh test so that's what it, that's how i see it and the only other question um <clears throat> this is justin uh the only other question i would ask to the uh to staff would be are you going to repropose those anytime soon the and what's that timeline look like emergency regulations the ones that were retracted yes that, those that will be this. those are, yes we anticipate to resubmit those for Emergency regulations, yes. What is the timeline on that? I don't know. <laughs> Soon. Um, they were retracted for OAL um, requested some changes for clarity. And so CDFA retracted them and will be resubmitting as an emergency again to ensure that we are implementing the, the state plan while the board continues to discuss future changes to the regulations that, again, can be incorporated at any time throughout this process. So we appreciate the board continuing to do that. But yes, we'll be resubmitting those. Can we request what the language that you're going to resubmit to the OAL looks like before you submit it to the OAL? It's the it, the there it's the clarifications. It'll be that language. Yeah. It's yeah. It there's some it's some clarity that was requested by OAL. There's not programmatic differences. So then, just to the board, it sounds like what's going to happen is they're going to reintroduce the exact same definition collection of any portion of the plant as harvest, and so that would be essentially reproposed and. If we were to motion this as it stands, as we've proposed for a recommendation, then most likely they would coincide when they land on the desk of the Office of Administrative Law and they would work through both at the same time. That's what it seems like potentially could happen in the process. So just to clarify, Justin, I, if you make the motion today, I would suspect that it likely would not be incorporated into the proposed regulation just because we would have to then um, not only incorporate that language in, but also incorporate justifications for why the definition is different, why each of these specific things is being excluded, which again is fine. It's something that we will do, um, but I don't think we'd be able to do it within the time frame necessary to ensure that we actually have those regulations in place, seeing as many of those code provisions are already currently in effect and are not able to be enforced because of the lack of regulation. So again, we do still have, besides the emergency rulemaking process, we do still have regular rulemaking to go through. Um, if the board makes recommendations, we can incorporate those into the regular rulemaking process and we can do those sooner than later. So we do appreciate the boards moving forward and, you know, again, not sure when the board is going to meet next, but the, the sooner we get those recommendations, the sooner we can start the process of incorporating them in. And just a reminder, making changes today does not preclude the board from making recommendations in the future. Um, we know not only are things that we know that need to be incorporated, but there's also, I'm sure, things we don't know, and there's gonna be additional changes just to accommodate the, the continuing evolving industry. And I think maybe we'd like to hear from Lisa, you know, uh, being the commissioner or, or sheriff, 
how do they feel about these potential emergency regs versus the proposed language that we're recommending now? Can you repeat the question? I, I'm not. I'm not clear. Yeah. It, it, from what it seems, what Josh is saying is that the emergency regs that were retracted that define as any portion of the plan yeah. collected uh, will be again proposed shortly. Uh, yes. And if if we don't make you know an actionable item around this proposed definition that we've recommended, then essentially we're going to be dealing with their recommended definition when the emergency regs get reintroduced. And so my question is, which definition do you like better? The one that they proposed, the staff has proposed as any portion of the plant, or the one that we've proposed from your standpoint as a regulatory? I don't think it's my decision whether or not I like a regulation or not. What my feeling or sense would be that we are out of time. So we will go into this fourth year of growing season with regulations that may or may not completely make sense and we will have to continually evolve as we go forward. So it would be my recommendation to table this discussion to come up with further, maybe better discussions just because the board makes a recommendation uh, to the secretary does not mean that they will move forward with anything at this time. So let's get it right uh, and then just hope that seasons eventually, you know, move forward in a positive way. And from just a pure, um, you know, from your expertise as a commissioner, uh, does one seem thinking through the process of directing your staff in the field? Does, does one seem to be less or more burdensome? And not opinion-based, but just thinking about the process in which You've been dealing with this this program. We've been operating without a definition thus far, so we've been taking guidance from CDFA on some of those uh, terminology or legality issues um, as we move forward, anyways. So without the definition, and and then maybe and thank you for that. I appreciate that. And then maybe Dave, uh, if you're still with us, I don't know if you have any feelings about one versus the other, um, but it seems like you know that we'd like to hear you know from your standpoint as well yeah um i think that uh you know i understand both both sides of you know waiting or just moving forward it's it's you know if the the emergency regulation comes back with the definition of harvest of just taking basically anything then it's going to be subject to interpretation you know across 58 counties um to mean you know like literally anything so I'll defer to the Ag Commissioner on that one because, you know, from the law enforcement side of it, we're going to defer to them to tell us what they think. And and so I'm I'm good either way. Um, if if we want to continue with the motion and, and push it forward, I'm good with that. I'm good with tabling it. Um, I just don't want us to to be standing in the way, you know, of of you know these legal hemp grows that are, you know, trying to plant and obviously harvest at some point this year. Thank and, you, Dave, for that. Uh, yeah, thanks, Dave. Um, Rob Porcello here. So the uh, what I wasn't aware of a couple things was that the emergency regulations had been withdrawn, uh, and then now I just became aware that the emergency regs are coming right back through. Um, and with that information in mind, um, we may want to. Uh, spend a little more time and consider uh, getting getting this right I, I don't see that based on what they've just sort of disclosed that it's going to make a difference uh, right now uh, well I, I feel like the time is of the essence I mean we we heard that from Josh and uh, um, this the the idea of having every county interpret the unworkable uh, the unworkable definition uh, sounds very chaotic and uh, sounds like that could be the greatest harm to the industry. And I, I think we should continue to move forward with the recommendation we have. Again, it's just a recommendation, and it gets CDFA working on something better, makes it gives them notice that the one they have is is not workable. And um, if it, you know, any concerns they have, they they have, they'll bring them right back to us. Hopefully, you know, in this uh, two way discussion between us and CDFA. And, and we can address those issues when they come. 
and we we don't have to uh, this is not the necessary there's no guarantee that this language will be the language it's was only being recommended to them and um, you know if there's any issues that they can proceed with it they uh, hopefully they bring it right back to us and we can work on that well, like I said, I, I definitely agree that I think um, the improvement upon the definition is quite extraordinary because the way it is, you know, currently uh, just has, has obviously created a lot of problems. And um, I think I think you were definitely going the right direction with it. And I think it needs to be amended. I think it needs to be improved. Um, and I think it's a discussion that, yeah, we, we need to continue moving forward. Um, I would. I would hate to make a like a final final decision on it at this point, um, but I, final. I, it's all recommendations. Yeah, I mean, as and long as, as it's Josh, recommendations. As Josh said we can recommend something different next meeting too. This is Kevin. I'd I'm like open to, either way. This is Kevin. I'd like to uh, see a vote on it. How the board votes? Yeah, we we have a motion in a second still. If we're ready, if we're done with discussion. Yes. Yes. Okay. Lisa? Yes. Kevin? Yes. Jack? Yes. Rob? I'll vote yes. Dave Robinson? Is he still with us? Yes. Yes. Richard Sorry? Yes. <laughs> Passes unanimously. It was a cliffhanger, man. So why don't we take a break and what? Yes. What do you want? 15 <laughs> minutes? 15? It's Cinco de Mayo. We don't get to go have margaritas. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 30 minutes. Well, if we can break as long as we need to get the answer for Luke, I'm I'm personally happy with that. I'm happy to dedicate my entire day to being here if that's what occurs. Okay, 2 o'clock. Okay,